Hello and welcome to the Megacast. Today's topic, transforming data protection, DRAS, and disaster recovery capabilities. Thank you so much for joining us on the Megacast by Actual Tech Media. On the event today, you'll hear from experts at Zerto, Rubrik, Clumio, Druva, Pure Storage, NetApp, SunGuard, and Ensono. What an awesome lineup of some of the most innovative transformational data protection and disaster recovery solutions on the planet today. If you have a disaster recovery challenge and you need to protect your data, I mean, who in IT doesn't, you're in the right place. Before we get started, there's just a few things that you should know about the event today. Uh, first off, my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as your moderator. As always, we want these events to be educational. We are all, we're all former IT professionals ourselves here at Actual Tech Media. We know it, how tough it can be out there in the world of enterprise IT, and we want to help you to solve your challenges. So that's the point of this event, help you to solve your problems around data protection and DRAS, help you to improve your RTO, improve your, improve your RPO, and you know, just help you to feel more confident in whatever solution that you're using so that if you are struck with a disaster of any shape or form, um, hopefully it's not ransomware or something like that, you can push a button and recover and get going uh, faster than ever before. Now, on the Megacast, I'd like to say we always have a, a lineup of mega prizes, a mega prize lineup. I'll talk about those here in just a moment, as well as the elgi eligibility requirements for the prize drawings. Uh, we also encourage your questions there in the questions pane. Many of you have already found that and have said hello or good morning, good afternoon. Of course, we encourage those, but we also want your questions. We're serious about making this educational, and we have a best question prize for each of our Q&A sessions on the event. I'll talk about that here in just a moment as well. Uh, we want this to be a social event. Uh, you can tweet directly from your audience console there on the right-hand side using the Twitter icon, and the hashtag for today's event will be automatically appended. Uh, of course, uh, you can also access all the actual tech media social channels on the top right-hand side of the audience console. And then there in the handouts tab, you'll find a number of resources I encourage you to check out. Uh, there are eBooks, uh, special trial links, uh, solution briefs, white papers, case studies, all sorts of great information. So I encourage you to check out the handouts tab as well. Now, as I said, our prize lineup today is really amazing. We have five Apple M1 MacBook Airs to give out on the Megacast. And then we have an Amazon, 30, Amazon $500 gift card uh, roughly every 30 minutes being given out on the Megacast today as well, one after each presentation. Of course, you must be live in attendance to qualify for the prize drawing. And I will be announcing the winners verbally on the event. Um, we also have our best question prizes, as if the other prizes weren't enough. Uh, we have uh, a best question prize, one for each of the sessions on the event today, and uh, that is for, let's see, eight Amazon $50 gift cards as well. Of course, you have to ask a question to be eligible for the prize drawings and also meet the actual Tech Media prize policy. We will contact the best question prize winners after the event. Uh, you can find the prize requirements there in the handouts tab as well, the actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. All prize winners must submit an IRIS form W9 to actual Tech Media, and you always have the option to make a donation to selected charities. Uh, over the years, we've donated thousands of dollars to charities thanks to generous prize winners who, you know, say win a laptop or something and say, hey, I would just, I've already got a laptop. I would love to help someone less fortunate and we would love to help you do that. I always enjoy it when I hear stories about prize winners doing that as well. We've done that in partnership with the Gorilla Guide Book Club. You can download free educational IT books there at gorilla.guide. There's a link to that in the handouts tab. And then I encourage you to follow all the actual tech media social channels. The hashtag for today's event is ATM Megacast on Twitter. Uh, you can find actual tech media there as me as well and me, your moderator, David M. Davis. Subscribe to all the actual tech media channels, YouTube, Facebook, and our 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes podcast store. Uh, we post all of our uh, events after the fact over on YouTube, so subscribe to us there and you can check out 
our video video interviews and snippets from all of these events. Uh, follow Actual Tech Media on Twi on uh, LinkedIn as well on the top right hand side of your audience console. And so with the housekeeping information out of the way, it's time for today's keynote presentation on the Megacast. I'm excited now to introduce you to Mr. Scott Becker of Actual Tech Media. Uh, Scott is a veteran IT uh, professional and journalist uh, with 25 years in the industry, a lot of experience, of course, around disaster recovery. And today he's going to be talking about triggering the DR plan, what we're prepping for. Scott, take it away. Thanks for the welcome, David. Over the next couple of hours, you're going to hear about innovative solutions for transforming your data protection, DRAS, and disaster recovery capabilities. For the next five minutes, we'd like to walk through what exactly we're preparing for. So understanding where the real threats lie is important for thinking about how to go about prioritizing different protections. In other words, you know, what are the main triggers that cause organizations to have to put their disaster re recovery plans into effect? There's been a lot of research and advice about disaster recovery, but a lot of it that you find out there is fairly old. Mainly it's notably pre-cloud and pre-ransomware. So we're gonna update that. We'll rank seven types of disasters and then we'll think about how they compare to how serious they were five years ago. Let's start with the most obvious type of disasters. These are your natural ones, wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, earthquakes, tsunamis, you name it. So I've slotted natural disasters in the seventh and last place. This is consistent with where things stood five years ago. These kinds of events are important and they can cause problems for days to weeks, even a month. They get a lot of headlines, but they account for relatively few cases of data loss. An extension of natural disasters is sixth on our list power outages. The reason this is bumped up above natural disasters is that there's some unnatural reasons for power outages. Infrastructure in the U.S. is getting old and creaky, and that deterioration can cause outages or make those outages last longer. The grid is also a prime target for hackers and nation state actors. So that's our number six. Number five is an oldie but goodie, hard drive failure or other hardware failure. This is obviously still a thing, but it's, it's lower in this list than it might have appeared in ratings of a few years ago when it would occasionally be in the top position or close to it. This isn't because hard drives are way better than they used to be. They still spin and things with moving parts are gonna fail. But the bigger issue is that organizations are so much less reliant on on-premises hardware. There are a lot of servers and internal data centers in place, but many are augmented by cloud file storage, cloud backup, and more and more applications and databases are stored outright in the cloud which leads to our next disaster, disaster category, uh, an extended outage at a, a SaaS or public cloud infrastructure provider. So I've ranked this number four. Is that fair? I don't know, but you know, the OVH cloud fire in March was a high profile example of a hosting company disaster that had catastrophic implications for several cloud companies and left a lot of organizations without recourse for getting their data back. I'd say cloud provider outages are probably less common than you know, run-of-the-mill internal problems that trigger a DR plan, but they're an emerging issue, and, and it's a priority for organizations to understand the, you know, the, the wrinkles of, uh, of cloud outages like that and to, and to get their arms around them. For number three, we'll go back to another old, oldie but goodie, user error, and I'll just give a, a fun story of my own here. I, I started at Actual Tech about a month ago, and setting up my new computer, I misconfigured my Dropbox, so Suddenly the disk on my new laptop was full. It was syncing the company files to my hard drive. Um, and I had to delete all those files from my laptop. So I had a conversation with my colleagues to ensure that when I deleted those files, I wouldn't be you know, deleting our, our copies from the cloud as well. So we're all using dozens of cloud tools every day. And, and we're sort of vaguely familiar with a lot of these tools. And, and you know, things, documentation it isn't kind of what it used to be. It, it, so disastrous user mistakes aren't going away. Then there's the pandemic. I read this John Barry book on the 1918 flu back in 2005. I was writing about IT and disaster recovery you know, back then. And I remember thinking how impossibly difficult it would be if everyone had to leave the office for six months to a year. So now we're 18 months into almost that exact scenario. Does it qualify as a disaster recovery scenario from a technology standpoint? Absolutely. 
But the, the technology infrastructure has evolved so much since 2005 that a lot of approaches for supporting workers in home offices and having admins run IT infrastructure from their homes would have seemed crazy 15 years ago. In 2020 and 2021, they were entirely doable. Still, this, this pandemic isn't over. And now we've all seen firsthand how these kind of bugs can sideswipe us in the future. So I put this one in at number two. At number two. And finally, we get to ransomware, which you know I believe is the number one threat that's triggering disaster recovery plans today. So this is a huge jump for security issues in general over the past. When it came to uh, DR, we used to think of you know viruses and maybe DDoS and, and other attacks as a sort of a bucket of problems that could require recovery. You know, ransomware broke onto the scene and, and now is the main security threat triggering DR responses and arguably the main issue of any kind triggering DR responses. So this is my completely subjective and somewhat arbitrary list. We'll ask you in a second, which of these is your top concern when it comes to disaster recovery. But ultimately the important thing is to have the conversation, analyze the threats and determine what solutions and approaches will help. David, back to you. All right, great presentation, Scott. Really appreciated that. I, I learned a lot there. Uh, the six steps, really love that, organizing it that way for us, so thank you. Um, before I introduce you to our first presenter, I've got a few poll questions and an interesting uh, offer, perhaps, for some of you. So here on your screen, you'll, you see a slide uh, where Actual Tech Media uh, has an upcoming event on October 20th. Uh, we're go we're going to do a ransomware summit. And one of the things we hope to do on there is share some existing news for practitioners out there around you know, your personal experience. And it could be completely anonymous. If you'd like us to anonymize it, that's fine. But we wanna hear your stories because you know, hearing what's happened to your fellow IT professionals, uh, how they got infected with ransomware, uh, what they had to do to recover, uh, those stories are, are, we find to be very educational and, and so does everyone out there in the audience. So we're looking for five compelling stories about organizations that were targets of ransomware we want to learn how you recovered and, and what you would do differently maybe next time, the lessons you learned. And each uh, selected submission, each of the five, will receive a gift card of $500 in exchange for your time, uh, which would just include a little bit of you know, maybe email, back and forth, and a quick phone call just to understand the details. You don't have to share your company name or even your name uh, publicly. You know, if you would uh, like to keep that anonymous, we totally understand. And I've got a quick poll here just to see uh, if there's anyone out there who is interested in sharing their ransomware story, either publicly or uh, anonymously. So I'll leave that up here for a moment and let everyone respond. All right, thank you to everyone who responded to that poll there. We do appreciate your feedback. Hope that you'll join us on that upcoming ransomware summit on October 20th. It's gonna be a great event. Now, uh, before we get started, I also want to remind you about the Gorilla Guide Book Club. You can download free educational IT books, some of them on ransomware and data protection and DR uh, at gorilla.guide. You can find a link to that there in the handouts tab, the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's all completely free. Encourage you to check that out. Um, also, I want to point out we do still have our refer a friend. Uh, or coworker, specifically IT friends, to Actual Tech Media's online events, and you both could win an Amazon $300 gift card. Uh, that drawing is held monthly. Uh, the link there is actualtechmedia.com slash event referral. You can also find um, a link to that at the end of the event. You'll be automatically redirected there. But if you want to click on the link right now, actually in your audience console on the slides window there, you can, and that will open up a new browser tab. All right, and now I've got another poll question for you, and that is, what's your time frame for adding new or updating existing IT solutions at your company, specifically around data protection and disaster recovery? And this is our last poll question before I introduce you to today's first presenter from Zerto. All right, thank you to everyone who responded there to the poll. It's time to kick off today's data protection, DRAS, and disaster recovery megacast event. 
I'm excited now to bring in our first presenter from Zerto, a Hewlett Packard Enterprise company. Welcome, Mr. Chris Rogers, technical evangelist. Chris, take it away. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this ATM webinar. My name is Chris Rogers, and I'm currently a technology evangelist at Zerto. So thank you for joining us today. So we're going to be talking about backup, disaster recovery, and disaster recovery as a service, the Zerto way. So briefly, an agenda. So why we need a new approach. We're going to look at the Zerto difference. We're going to then look at the flexible deployment options, and then move on to the future of data protection. So why do we need a new approach? So in most organizations, we're going to see things like data growth and IT sprawl, uh, the acceleration of cloud adoption, especially over the last 18 months with COVID and the pandemic, making people change the way they do IT and actually consume IT as well. And then the explosion of ransomware that's happened over the last few years is something we can't get away from. It's something that hits even the biggest of companies uh, around the world and something that we need to be aware of and how do we protect from that as well. So we're always in this always on world now. So it's Amazon Prime, it's Netflix, everything is on demand whenever we need it. And that's true of IT consumers and users as well. So we always need that always on capability to be able to minimize downtime and minimize the amount of data loss we have is gonna be crucial to controlling an always on approach, but also helping to protect the data that's sprawling and, and the, the massive data growth we have. How do we help accelerate the cloud? How do we help move data into the cloud, but also potentially back out again if we need to? And then how do we recover from ransomware in a timely manner that isn't gonna cost the company a lot of time or money or worse, have to pay a ransom? So when people are talking about disaster recovery, data protection and DRAS, we're normally looking at the left-hand side of this screen. So traditional disaster recovery for infrastructure failures, natural disasters and, and full power outages. And then when we go into backup and recovery, things like user errors, file deletions, database corruptions, um, and equally ransomware. And I think ransomware can span both of those categories. So um, disaster recovery and backup and recovery, depending on how bad the ransomware attack is and how far it's got into your um, infrastructure. And it may require a whole site failover to recover from. But actually when we're looking at disaster recovery and DRAS, how do we then move it towards the right hand side as well? So get extra use cases out of disaster recovery, DRAS and data protection. So we start incorporating things like long term retention for legal requirements or compliance. And we can use it for data mobility. So migrations, maybe to, to a new data center, um, cloud adoption to enable our hybrid cloud and multi cloud strategies. And then also data center consolidations. So moving from three or four data centers down to, to just one or two. And also data reuse. So for things like test and development, using it for dev and test sandboxes, for patch management, using that data we have, spinning it up quickly, doing whatever we need to do with it. So that could be as a patch management, vulnerability scanning, anything like that, but then spinning it back down as to not impact production workloads. So hopefully we'll be able to um, solve for all use cases for the unplanned, which is DR and, and backup and recovery, the things we, we don't want to happen and we don't have any foresight of happening but also into the planned issues and planned outages. So things like migrations and legal requirements as well. So when I look at like legacy data protection stack, we see kind of four areas. So traditionally we'd have a disaster recovery tool. So from go to from data center A to data center B, usually something like a recover point or something along those lines using array-based replication, requires the same storage at each site comes with both technical difficulties and financial uh, difficulties as well, being quite expensive and quite hard to run. And then organizations would need a backup and recovery solution as well for those more small use cases where we don't want whole site failovers, we want just an individual file or folder back. And then we would need automation and orchestration on top of that because we can't do whole site failovers or even just a single application failover or recovery without some kind of automation orchestration helping us out. And then we'd need something to help us to migrate into, out of, and between cloud environments. All these things come with different UIs. They come with a massive stretch on resources and time, from installation, management, upgrades. 
They all require new training and potentially professional services to put them in and keep them running. And all going to have with separate licensing and separate pricing and different vendors to contact when something is, uh, isn't quite right. So all these things build up to a potentially a big problem across multiple different solutions becoming very complex. So let's look at the Zerto difference. So we've got a singular platform to cover all these use cases. Underpinning every technology we have is our continuous data protection, enabling us to achieve the fastest RPOs, fastest RTOs. We do that with near synchronous replication, full application recovery, and journal-based recovery as well, which we'll go to into a bit more detail in a little bit. And then a hybrid cloud environment, being able to help you with workload mobility, but also disaster recovery, backup in between, from, and to private cloud or public cloud environments. And even some of our 350 disaster recovery as a service partners out there as well. And then built at scale and built with simplicity in mind. So we have built in orchestration and, and automation across our whole tool set, not an individual product, not an add on built into the product. So let's look at continuous data protection, or I'm, I'm going to call it CDP for the rest of the, uh, the rest of the presentation. So our CDP engine is um, what enables Zerto to get its RPOs and RTOs to where they are today. So it's a software only simple deployment. We use CDP on premises and in the cloud. And the beauty of our CDP engine, it has zero production impact on virtual machines. So we don't need to worry about things being stunned. We don't need to worry about things happening overnight because it happens continuously throughout the day with zero impact to, to virtual machines. So we have no scheduling. We don't take snapshots and we don't install any agents. So that really helps our simplicity and making sure that you are always protected. And this, then we don't have any need for the same storage or hardware. So we're hardware and storage agnostic across all of those um, environments for you as well. So we don't need to make sure we have the same storage at both sites or even the same hypervisor at both sites. We can replicate between and cross hypervisors as well. And now we look at granularity. So this is where our journal comes in. So we can recover data from seconds. So from five to 10 seconds is our normal kind of recovery um, point objective for virtual machines and files and folders, but also we can enable long term retention in, in the uh, in the product as well to kind of span from seconds all the way through to, to years to enable you to recover the data you need from whenever you want it. We also have the ability to recover whole sites. So every single virtual machine in your site, an individual application. So just a subset of virtual machines. Um, or we call it a, vir a virtual protection group. So a logical group of virtual machines that need to be protected and recovered together. An individual virtual machine, or also an individual file from inside those virtual machines as well. So enabling you to recover all of these objects from seconds of granularity with automation orchestration built on top for super quick RTO as well. So you can see in the image I've got here, that this particular um, file and folder restore, I've got 1,586 points in time I can recover to. So that's giving me and the users of the data and the owners of the data that really, really granular restore approach to be able to give them back almost to the second the exact data they need. So minimizing that data loss and maximizing uptime. And now we come on to application consistent recovery. So I think this is really, really important to help speed up our RTOs um, and also for our simplicity as well. So what we do at Zerto is we take an application stack. So this application stack here, so an app server, a web server, DB server and file server. And every five to 10 seconds, we're taking a checkpoint of all those virtual machines in that application. So when we come to recovery, all the applications are recovered as a single entity rather than just their component parts being potentially hours um, away from each other, the whole application gets restored to the exact same point in time as a single entity. So it's going to speed up our RTO and also minimize risk because we've got less manual actions to do when we're trying to recover. And I think that's a really, really important aspect of disaster recovery and data protection is protecting assets as they need to be used and not to what the tool will let you protect them as. So now we look at long-term retention. 
I think there's one of our, our great advantages here is that we can remove backup windows from people's environments. So we don't need to worry about running things overnight because again, we have zero impact on production for those long-term retention copies, which means we don't have to worry about those morning checks and get up and seeing if anything has been stunned overnight by snapshots or anything has hung or resolving anything until um, customers and consumers get online. We can do that throughout the day whenever you need it because we have that zero impact. We also give you a choice of backup storage. That could be anything. Because we're software only, we don't dictate that you need to buy our hardware appliances or store your data in a certain place to make use of it. We can let you back up to anything you'd like to. So purpose-built backup appliances like a HP store once, a simple NFS or SMB share, S3 compatible storage, for instance, or even cloud native storage. So like Amazon S3 and Azure Blob storage as well. We also have immutability built into our Amazon S3 capabilities as well. So being able to make sure that those backups are tamper proof. And then we have automated cloud tiering, enabling us to store the backups in the most sensible and cost effective storage class in the cloud as well. So we can automate that uh, cloud tiering from Amazon S3 standard down to AWS Glacier and also from Azure um, standard to core and then eventually to Azure Archive as well. So making sure your data is in the right place but also in the most cost effective place for your for your backups as well. And then we have the built in automation and orchestration. So I know we've gone over this a little bit before, but I just want to run you through what that means for us. So for us at Zerto, we don't believe that automation and orchestration should be something that's written by anybody else apart from the tool that you're using. So we do have an API that allows you to, you know, allow extensibility into other applications or for custom use cases. But all of our main um, products, main features and main use cases have automation and orchestration built in to the back of them. So they're simple and repeatable work, workflows for all recovery operations, whether that's a file level recovery or a whole site recovery that can be done with just a few clicks as well. We have the ability to protect and mobilize thousands of VMs with automated VM protection. So you know that your VMs are always going to be protected because we're using CDP and any new VMs that get built will automatically be protected as well. We have non-disruptive testing again with just a few clicks, but after we've done the, the, the failover testing, we have ready made compliance reporting to help with your compliance needs as well. And the way our software is architected will automatically scale up and down with your environment. So it doesn't matter how many VMs you start off with or how many you end up with, our software works in exactly the same way and we don't have to plan for potentially peak from when we're installing. We can plan for just a very small deployment and then grow, um, grow our estate or equally we could land on a massive estate but equally then start uh, moving it down as we're moving to things like Kubernetes and SaaS deployments. Then full visibility with analytics and I always think that you know Disaster recovery and data protection is one of the things we always have to have, but it's really important that we know what it's currently doing. So we have, you know, historic events for trend analysis, real time monitoring capabilities, allowing you to do uh, threat detection, anomaly uh, detection inside of there. We've got graphs that will enable you to, to look and see exactly when your peaks and troughs are in your usage. We help you have capacity management capability as well. So showing you exactly how much storage is being used by Zerto. And then also we have a resource planner, which can help you um, plan for your resources in public cloud deployments, know exactly how much storage you're going to be using. And then we can put that into calculators to help you work out what your costing is going to be as well. So having that an analytics service, again, free of charge in all of our license types and being a SaaS service, there's no additional infrastructure on top of what you're currently deploying with Zerto today. So he's talking about disaster recovery and DRAS and, and, and data protection. This is how we unlock our cloud agility. We have easy implementation and ongoing management. It's a single pane of glass. It's the same UI no matter where we deploy to. So you can see across on, onto the slide here, we, we support Microsoft Azure and AVS solution, the VMware Google Cloud Engine, Amazon Web Services, IBM Cloud, VMware and Oracle Cloud, and as I said, 350 of our MSP providers as well. So no matter when you're, whether you're trying to do DR yourself, so traditional you know, disaster recovery between two hypervisor environments, maybe you want to do disaster recovery as a service into the cloud, so into Microsoft Azure or AWS, 
Or maybe you'd like a fully managed disaster recovery as a service solution to one of our managed service providers. We use the same technology across all of these capabilities, so allowing the user and the end user to be able to protect their data in the best way possible. So in cloud native architecture, we've actually changed the way we do things. So inside of Azure, for instance, in here, we've not just lifted and shifted our approach from on-premise, so our VMware and Hyper-V environments, and put that into the cloud and say, we've got a great cloud methodology. We were actually utilizing some of the, the cloud native features inside of Azure. So we use Azure scale sets and Azure queues to give you quicker recovery times, but also cost efficiency and scale as well. If we just did things in a normal way, we're not going to be making use of that scale of the cloud, the efficiency, and also the automatic scale up and scale down that the cloud offers us, giving us reduced costs, but also increased efficiencies as well. So, so these are some of the examples that Zerta have done to enable us to use public cloud to the best of the ability and not just lift and shift from premise into public cloud. So here's a, um, a customer success story from Microsoft Azure and Zerto. I think one of the great uh, quotes from here is just at the bottom there, you know, they just work seamlessly. And that's what IT operators and users want. Disaster recovery, data protection, and disaster recovery as a service can, can be quite challenging, especially when we're talking about anything at scale. But with Zerto and Azure, they work seamlessly together as this customer has stated, and giving them the peace of mind that their VMs are automatically protected, but also recovering in an environment that has scale and performance when they need it. So not having to worry about constantly keeping anything up to date, but making sure that their primary IT is protected into an estate that they know will be able to re recover to. So what about the future of data protection? I know I've been speaking a lot about virtual machines and um, an infrastructure. So what's the future? So what are we looking at beyond virtual machines? So here at Zerto, we've now launched Zerto for Kubernetes. This launched earlier earlier this year in April, and it's the exact same approach that we're doing for virtual machines, but inside of a Kubernetes environment. So we're still using continuous data protection. We're still application centric, meaning we still bundle all the components of an application together and replicate those as a single entity. We still have automation and orchestration with simple workflows. We allow you to do data protection as code. So actually building it into the application itself rather than it being an afterthought and enabling you to unlock that hybrid cloud and multi-cloud strategy. So we're not locked into a storage platform or a Kubernetes engine. We can be agnostic across those Kubernetes deployments, whether that's going from the Azure Kubernetes service um, between regions or the um, Amazon Kubernetes engine. We can do that across all those and even on-premise deployments as well. So things like OpenShift into public cloud as well. And all of these things are going to be available inside with deep analytics as well. So that's going to be feeding into our analytics platform, giving the same visibility of your estate, whether you're running virtual machines or you're running containers. And what about the next abstraction? So if we're not running any infrastructure, we're running SaaS operations. Well, it's still important to have that data protection option for, for our SaaS applications as well. So Zerto Backup for SaaS, powered by Keepit. It's a simple, easy and hassle-free solution. It's a cloud-to-cloud -cloud solution. So we don't need to worry about installing any additional infrastructure or where we're gonna store our data or providing our own storage. This is completely cloud-to-cloud -cloud in our own data centers. And it's secured with immutability and, and compliance on top of that as well. So we cover the main um, SaaS applications today. So Microsoft 365, Google Workspace, Salesforce, and Microsoft Dynamics 365. And that comes with unlimited storage and unlimited retention on a per user license basis as well. So it's really, really great and really good to understand. So let's dig a little bit deeper into Microsoft 365. So again, powered by Keepit, but it gives us the best and most complete coverage for Microsoft 365. So we cover emails, calendars, shared mailboxes, the in-place archive, OneDrive, SharePoint, groups, teams, teams chat, public folders, you name it, we protect it in 365. So again, the most best and complete coverage. We've got things like easy find and easy restore. So we can find anything from any point in time and easily restore it either back into uh, directly into 365 or even just download it to have an offline copy um, for, for um, different reasons. 
and also we have lifetime retention. So we're not going to limit you to the amount of time you can keep these backups, but a limited retention across all your users. So making sure you have exactly the data you need when you need to recover it from. So great, thanks for listening to me. So we've got some great resources for you as well today. So if you'd like to see the live tailored demo of Zerto, so please email sales at Zerto.com. We'll get one of the guys to get back to you so we can understand your requirements and let you see exactly what you want to see from the Zerto platform. We also have a great hands-on lab section as well. So you can test drive Zerto in a self-paced environment, completely free of charge. That includes an Azure lab as well. So if you're thinking about doing disaster recovery into Azure, then you can do that through our labs process as well. We have a great TCO calculator, so you can estimate your, your total cost of ownership and see where you can save money with our free online tool. And also please check out our reviews, because our reviews are great on Gartner Peer Insights and IT Central Station as well. So you know, hear from what your peers actually think about Zerto as well. So I'd like to open up to, uh, to any questions. So I've been monitoring the chat and uh, I'll answer your questions now. So thank you very much for listening and I hope you found this valuable. Great presentation, Chris. Really appreciated that. I learned a lot about Zerto, and obviously there's a lot of excitement here from the audience as well. I see 36 questions in the queue for you. So, um, Chris, you ready for uh, a few of those? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can see loads of questions. I tried to answer as much as I can as, as I was going along. So, uh, thanks for sending questions. Yeah, let's throw some at me. Excellent. Yeah. I want to encourage everyone out there to answer the poll question on the screen there as well. I just brought up. Uh, we encourage you to respond to that. We appreciate your feedback. Um, let's see. First question I wanted to ask you, there's a couple here around uh, failback. Um, what, what does Zerto do around failback? Is it possible? How does it work? Yes. So in Zerto, we've got a really easy, um, as you can imagine, automated and orchestrated way of doing that. So in the failover process, um, we have a failback tick box. Um, which enables you to then reverse replicate everything from where you're going or where you're going to back to the um, original site and then it's just the same process so you can um, do either a controlled failback or, or a move operation in Zerto or you can do a, a failover like you would have done for the initial um, initial, initial restore initial replication and recovery into the, the secondary site so essentially we can do a tick box which will then reverse replicate everything back again and then we use automation orchestration to move that move the workloads back across again Got it. Okay, excellent. Uh, let's see here. Stephanie's asking, uh, can Zerto protect my uh, on-premises Kubernetes cluster? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it all depends on exactly what uh, on-premise Kubernetes cluster you're running. Um, but um, we've got more and more support for uh, for platforms coming out. I think it's OpenShift and Mantra and Tanzu and all those kind of big names you hear in, in Kubernetes world. They're all um, they're all coming. Um, I think OpenShift is supported today. Tanzu will be very shortly supported as well. So. So yes, um, absolutely it can do, and that can be recovered into a cloud environment as well. So it doesn't have to be the exact same uh, infrastructure or the exact same Kubernetes flavor, if you will, where you're recovering to. Very nice. Yeah, that, that's cool. I like that flexibility. Um, there's another question here about the Zerto licensing model. How does that work? Yeah, so, so for VMs, it works on, on a per VM basis. So we have subscription-based licensing and perpetual licensing. Um, and if you're replicating to any of our um, cloud service providers, they'll have to see their own um, consumption-based licensing model available as well. Okay, okay, nice. And then um, what about the architecture of Zerto? Is it, is it hardware? Is it software? Does it require any hardware? Yeah, so the beauty of, of Zerto is it is fully a software platform only. Sorry, a <laughs> software-only platform, which means no additional um, infrastructure required at either your primary site or your disaster recovery site. Um, so simple to set up and easy to use as well. So no additional infrastructure required. Um, that means you can re you can have choice of vendor as well. So you can have um, completely separate solutions. So completely separate storage from, from one site to the other site, even across hypervisor as well. So you can even go from VMware to Hyper-V or even VMware into Azure AWS native as well. So we can do that on the fly for you as well. Very nice. And then there's a couple of folks out here, obviously, who are interested in doing a POC or trying this out. Um, how does that work? Is there a, a trial or something they can sign up for? Yes, there's a free trial on the website. Um, so if you, if you go through a website, you'll be able to find that. But also, there's also a really good hands-on lab. So if you're if you're fancy getting kind of hands-on uh, with Zerto um, and don't fancy doing kind of a formal POC through the sales process and like that, you can go onto the, the hands-on labs 
um, and that you can then do various different um, guided kind of learning and, and kind of set your own sandbox up. There's one for ransomware, which was topical for some things that were mentioned earlier. So you can show how Zerta can recover from ransomware quickly and easily. Um, and also, um, you know, for our Azure customers as well, there's an Azure um, lab available. So you don't need any um, infrastructure or even an Azure account. We set it all up for you. So you can see how we work in that hybrid cloud, multi-cloud model as well. Very nice. I like that. It sounds like it's really easy to get started, especially since it's all software. Uh, Great solution. Looks like that's all the time I'm, I'm afraid we have for our live Q&A, but there's a lot more electronic questions there for you in the queue, Chris. Uh, if you can get back to those, I'm sure those folks would appreciate it. Thank you so much for your excellent Absolutely. presentation. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time. All right. Uh, and for more information on Zerto, check out the Handouts tab right there in your audience console. And it's there that you can download a PDF resource uh, on the Zerto solution. And of course, visit Zerto.com as well. And I'll leave up the poll question for anyone who hasn't yet responded while I announce our first prize. Our first prize. Here we go. Uh, so we've got an Amazon $500 gift card. This is going out to Chris Vicara from Minnesota, congratulations. And why not? Let's, let's announce a grand prize uh, for an Apple M1 MacBook. This is going to John Mangrich from California. Congratulations. We'll reach out, of course, to all the prize winners after the event. All right, thank you to everyone who responded to the poll. Let's keep the megacast moving. It's now time to move on to our next presentation. I'm excited now to introduce you to Mr. Carl Norwich, go-to-market lead for AppFlows at Rubrik. Carl, thanks for being on. Thanks for having me again. Absolutely. Yeah, take it away. Tell us about AppFlows at Rubrik. Yeah, I'd be happy to. It's great to uh, be here uh, with everyone. Thank you for your time today. And uh, I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about uh, what Rubrik's done in our portfolio around disaster recovery. But uh, what we like, to, what I'd like to do first is, is that um, some of you folks may not have Rubrik today. Some of you may. So I think it's important to at least get kind of a foundation of what Rubrik does, where we came from, why we've been so successful, and obviously where we're going to be taking the product into the future. So you know, start out with that. Um, you know, we we were born five years ago um, as a as a modernized backup uh, system or platform. Uh, we found tons of success over the years. Uh, over 2,000 customers. Um, well over uh, uh, right at 2,000 employees as well in just a short five years. And wh why did we have that success? So really we focused in on these three areas and have had a lot of success in doing so. First of all, automating data protection overall. overall. I'm sure I have backup administrators, uh, managers, even leaders and directors. And I think we can all agree is that traditionally how data protection was handled has been very manual. You essentially throw uh, full-time employees at it. It takes a lot of time, burden, and management. And what we've done effectively brought automation to that whole practice of meeting business objectives, SLAs and otherwise. The uh, second part of it is, is we can drive uh, automated recovery and rapid recovery from either, you know, just a normal user deleted a file, user broke a VM, user broke an Oracle database, all the way to we got hit by ransomware and how do we get our systems online as quickly as possible. And lastly, the whole foundation of the system is built upon an immutable file system or an immutable platform, if you will. Uh, that, that term is used and overused candidly a lot in the marketplace. So let me describe to you what I mean by that. Is that when we wrote our own file system as a part of the platform or the, or the rubric application stack, as you will, is that we wrote our own file system. And as a part of doing that, what we did is that we designed it so that there is no command, there is no utility, there is nothing within our file system that allows for an override of data meaning the data is locked in time. It's also known as an append-only file system. What that's meant to say is I write an object of data into the file system. I can no longer manipulate that data in any way. All I can do is append files to it, which means fundamentally we've created a logical gap within our platform, which means the data is always available for you, uh, regardless of the surrounding circumstances. So diving in a bit more, I'd mentioned automation. And we kind of got into it, is that if you think about how backup platforms or backup solutions, I should say, have been handled in the past, that's really been an approach of, you know, buy backup software, buy servers to support that, size it appropriately, buy disk, maybe buy a replication target, then hire an iron mountain, put it in a tape, and then put it in a salt mine. And we wanted to take all of those fundamentals and put them into one single scalable platform. And that's the fundamentally what Rubrik does. 
would give you the capability to uh, deploy a single appliance or a single instance of our software, which is infinitely scalable. And it is everything. It's your backup system. It's your proxy. It's your arch it's uh, your deduplication engine. It has native cloud archive capabilities. All of these things are built into a single management point and a single point of scale for the business, which makes it much easier to understand. The second part is about accelerating recovery. So typically when you have to do a recovery, you have to pull data from disk, you have to go and restage it, you have to copy data from point A to point B. Um, and that's extremely challenging. I mean, that, that means that you have extended downtime for application owners, users, and for the, ultimately the business. So what we've done in, within our system is we give you the ability to turn the data on live directly off of our appliance and then migrate it. So you can do this with VMware, Hyper-V, AHV, SQL databases, Oracle databases, which gives you an RPO or recovery, or RTO, I should say, recovery time objective of minutes, not hours. Additionally, what we've done is we've integrated the ability to do search of your files, so you can do file level recovery, whether the data set be locally available on the appliance, whether it be in an S3 or a blob store, or whether it be at the replica DR rubric. So inherently, again, what we've done is we've tried to funnel and simplify the entire operational cadence of recovery in the same way that we've done protection. And then lastly, because of this, because you have one single point of management, because you have one single point um, of scale, is that we've driven down the, the cost of backup, both in time of transition, meaning you move ahead of rubric today, how long your time is that you have your product online for producing business services, but also the ongoing costs, because it is, is scalable, you, there's no forklift upgrades. There's none of the migration costs that you have associated with the traditional product. You get in, you, you inherently are going to be saving costs, not only in the, the fact that you only have to buy one solution, not three to four to five, but also on the fact that operationally, your operations team or you as the operators only have to manage one solution, not a variety of them. And we see in, in, in terms of real hard dollar costs that we're saving anywhere from our clients, anywhere from 30 to 50% on their backup solution existing today. And again, this is why the proof's in the pudding with, in terms of results. Rubric is what's known as a unicorn out of Silicon Valley, rated in the top five startups uh, by LinkedIn even most recently. We, these uh, data points that I'm providing you are real and have played out over the years that we've been in the marketplace. So that's the foundation of the company. So let's talk a little bit about what I specialize in. Um, I, I, my responsibility is to bring new products and offerings to market. So what we've brought to market is, is uh, orchestrated disaster recovery, leveraging and deriving more business services out of your backup. So the way to think about this is that what I just described to you a moment ago was very backup centric. We automate the ability to capture your data based on an SLA concept versus a job. We replicate your data and we maintain all of those SLAs and everything else, everything that I just described a moment ago. But that's backup. What, how, how can we derive more business services or more business value out of those backups as opposed to having them sitting there stale, um, just waiting for something to go wrong? But the key is that at the end of the day, we are a software company and we are a SaaS company and that's our future. And really, that's the ability for us to drive forward additional business services without selling additional hardware or consuming more floor tile. And that's where our SaaS platform comes into place that we call Polaris. Now, you know, as, as users, it doesn't really matter much to you, but just so you know, there's a platform in the cloud that is rubric built, rubric certified, rubric hardened in terms of security that gives us an ability to add additional business, business services on top of the backups that you're already capturing today. A couple of examples of where we've done this is uh, rent, Ransomware recovery, remediation, and triage, and a product that we call Radar. What it does fundamentally is it watches your backup, learns your backups over time, learns their change rates through machine learning algorithms so that we can identify, A, have you been hit by a disgruntled employee or a ransomware attack? And secondarily, let's give you an easy-to-use tool that can help you fully triage what is the attack vectors, what business services have impacted, and how am I going to prioritize that recovery? And again, this happens as a consequence of a SaaS app that was added, this writing, if you will, on top of the backup data that we're already capturing day to day. Secondly, uh, data classification. Why not? What PII information, HIPAA information, depending upon what compliance uh, adherences that you have as a business. Instead of having a satellite solution, we've got all the data captured, we've got it all indexed. Why don't we provide you the ability to apply analyzers to those data sets and understand, is my data where I need it to be? Do the right users have access to it? and take remediation tests based on that information. So imagine being able to layer in data classification via a SaaS app without having to consume any additional on-premise hardware. And in that light, that's exactly how we intend to do disaster recovery as well. 
if you think about it, if we're already backing up your virtual environment on premise, we're already replicating it for purposes of disaster recovery. Why can't we layer in the instruction set and the orchestration required to give you business continuity or our site failover? And that's exactly what we've done. We're allowing our backup product to do what it does best, capture data, maintain SLAs, maintain business compliance, replicate that data. And via a SaaS app, we've layered on all the orchestration instructions to move your applications or fail them over gracefully between sites. And a fundamental way to way think about it is we've decoupled the data movement process from the logic and the orchestration. Now, the last thing, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this, is the best part of SaaS app for anybody who's an operator out there is that you no longer have to worry about code updates. You don't have to worry about doing change management. You don't have to worry about hot fixes. You don't have to worry about patch releases. All of that stuff is managed by us on our SaaS platform. You get to be a true consumer of a solution as opposed to both the on-premise manager and the consumer of the solution. So it really lightens the load from an operations perspective on how you, you, how you interact with the product or the, the um, solution. Great. So next, let's talk a little bit about the current state of disaster recovery. Um, when we brought this product to market, we went through a, a very lengthy process of interviewing customers who have products today. I've personally done four startups um, in the last 10 years or so, and in every case of those startups, we were going into what's called an incumbent space. What I mean by that is, is that there was already something there previous to us, but we believed that we could do it better and be transformative in that same area. So in this case, obviously disaster recovery has been around for some time. So it was really important for us to understand what are the pain points around what's already out there? Because if we don't address those, we're not gonna make it very far. So first of all, complexity was a theme with all of the legacy providers, both in ongoing operational management or runtime management, if you will, as well as just getting the solution stood up in the first place. So how can we lower the complexity, make the product much easier to use and much easier to get online so that you're, again, time to value. You write a check and how quickly are we providing a business services? How, how much can we narrow that? So we put a lot of focus on, let's take the complexity out of disaster recovery. Secondly, the expense. Um, this is, I'll give you a compelling stat is that most DR solutions aren't able to sell to more than 10 to 15% of any, any uh, client's uh, application stack. Why is that? Because of the cost. At the end of the day, you're only going to spend high dollar premiums on things that are most important to the business and rely upon manual intervention for everything else. So how can we drive down expense so that you can afford to have DR orchestration for your entire data center and all of your applications, not just the most important ones? So there's a heavy focus there for us as well. And then lastly, uh, best of breed or siloed solutions. I mean, I think we would all agree that free rounds of golf and free lunches are nice for vendors, but at the end of the day, operationally, the less products that you have on your data center floor, the more efficient you're going to be as an operations team and as an IT business. So obviously we brought disaster recovery into our portfolio, but what, but what we've also done is we've made a real effort to make it so that if the way that you manage uploads is integral to the way you manage rubric today. Meaning if you're comfortable with managing rubric today, you're going to be comfortable managing this DR solution that has been added onto the portfolio, it's not a satellite solution in any way. All right, so that was a bit of preamble. Let's talk a bit about how it works. This is always the fun part. So first let's talk about vernacular. So in this market, you hear terms like runbook or a, a virtual protection group or something to that effect. Our equivalent is going to be what we call an application blueprint or blueprint for short. So think of that as a logical container where you're going to say this set of VMs is representative of a particular application. It's also where you're going to tell us things such as the boot order. In which order do you want us to bring the VMs online on the DR side so the application comes online gracefully? What compute and storage would you like us to leverage on the DR side? Uh, what networking would you like us to apply to the VM so they settle in nicely into the DR uh, site's networking schema? Um, uh, what postscripts to run? And lastly, at the end of the day, we are a backup company at our core. So what SLA or what protect backup policy do you want us to automatically assign to these workloads as they fail over? Because of, unfortunately for all of us, just because you have a DR event does not mean that we're not compliant to any kind of regulations and capturing data because we are producing at the end of the day production data. We're just doing it at our DR site. So we've automated this end to end. Now, what I would call out here is that the ease of use and setting up a blueprint and how it's in principle designed is that if you, as you notice in my, my list there, there isn't you setting up a replication schema. There isn't you setting up an RPO because all of that is being done by your backups because we're leveraging your backup data, consolidating the amount of data movements required from data center to data center, and again, deriving more value out of it. So what the blueprint is in net net 
is the orchestration instructions, but it has nothing to do with the data movement, which is already happening as a consequence of your backups. So very much simplifying the process of creating, maintaining these, and also driving reliability. Next, let's talk about RTOs, recovery time objectives. So we actually give you choice here, uh, a better best, if you will. We have a capability to give you an extremely low RTO, but maybe a little bit longer RTO, but has lower runtime costs. So let's talk through those very quickly. So first of all, let's talk about the, what we call incremental export or a standby option, if you will. So if you imagine on the left-hand side there, that's your production rubric cluster backing up your virtual environment. As a reminder, and for those who aren't aware, we are an incremental forever system, meaning we take one full for the lifetime of the VM, and then it's an incremental for backup thereafter, so only the deltas. And that information is being uh, replicated to a DR rubric cluster. What the DR rubric cluster is going to do with this concept of the lowest RTO is we're going to stage a copy of each one of those VMs into a data store proactively. So the idea behind this is, is that let's get the data movement part of the equation handled proactively so that if I have an outage or I have a DR test, our RTO is going to be very low and very consistent because it doesn't require us to move any data. It simply is a matter of us applying networking schema, running post scripts, bringing them on in the right order and otherwise. So it's going to give you that very low and consistent RTO regardless of how big the VMs are. Now, we have an unfair advantage here, too, because, again, at the end of the day, we are a backup company. What I mean by that is, is that you can select from any recovery point available on that DR rubric cluster, and we'll simply rewind those images to the point in time that you've selected. So you get a lot. So if you start thinking bad code updates, uh, ransomware attacks, and otherwise, you're not stuck with that latest recovery point. Because it's sitting on an immutable file system, you can, you can rest easy knowing those recovery points are going to be available to you. <clears throat> But you get flexibility at the end of the day. Now, the other option that I mentioned was something that we call an on-demand export, if you will, which is going to have a longer RTO, but it, we feel like it has this purpose based on customer feedback. Same deal. I'm, rep I'm backing up on production. I'm replicating over to DR. The difference is, is that the DR rubric cluster is not going to copy that data into the data store until you have a DR event or a DR test. Now, you might ask yourself, why would I do that? Well, think about all those tier three and those tier four applications that you still need as a business, but they aren't business critical. And you have your bosses saying, why can't we retest some of that DR equipment for different purposes, maybe test DR, sandboxes and otherwise. So imagine being able to have more flexibility in how you leverage that DR equipment so it provides real-time business value. You have a DR event, you clear that space off, you hit a button, and the operations team gets the benefit of orchestration and the business gets the benefit of being able to retask some of that hardware for those lower, lower tier applications. So it's all about assigning the right RTO to the value of the, to the business service appropriately. So again, about flexibility. In terms of recovery points, this is driven by your backup, uh, your backup cadence, as I mentioned earlier. Now, however often you back up your data and replicate it are the recovery points that are available for app flows to use. But what I don't want to call out here is, again, flexibility is the theme. And a lot of the feedback that we've gotten from our clients is, well, modern apps are different. They don't require write fidelity. They're not uh, tightly coupled from a stack perspective. They're generally loosely coupled or disparate nowadays. Meaning, let's say I have a three-tier application, which is a web server, an app server, and then a database server tier, uh, tier. Well, my web server is largely static. I don't want to run continuous data protection against that VM. It doesn't make sense. It's, it's overkill. So let's maybe back it up, say, once a day. Secondly, my apps here, those are largely stateless nowadays. You know, you need to capture configuration changes, but there's no real data there to be lost. So let's back it up, say, every four to eight hours. And again, reminding you, it's an incremental forever system, so only the deltas are captured. Uh, but lastly, that database here, where the information lives, where the transaction lives, where the business, uh, the, the value to business is living. Let's run continuous data protection against that tier. And all three of those VMs can coexist in the same blueprint. So when you go through to do a DR test or a DR event, the system will call out this variance and recovery points. And then you can make a decision, yes, I'm good at that variance, or you get an opportunity to dial them in a little bit closer. But again, the whole idea here is let's apply the right resource, even to the right tier of the application, as opposed to making it generically uniform across the entire app, wasting resources. All right, so let's talk about failover and fail back. So uh, failover is two clicks in the confirmation phrase. RTO, of course, is going to vary based on am I doing uh, that staging concept that I mentioned, incremental export, or am I doing it on demand? But really what I, where I want to focus in here is on the fail back. 
So how can we automate the fail back process? Most DR products are very good at getting one way, but they're not so good at getting back. So what we want to do is automate as much as we possibly could in regards to failing back. So if you remember, as part of that blueprint definition, you're assigning a, a backup schema to it, what we at Rubric call an SLA or service level agreement. Now it serves two purposes. The first purpose is of course to continue to back up the data as we fail over to DR so that we can maintain our business and compliance uh, requirements. But it also serves a second purpose. It is also can inverse replication either back to your production site or to a tertiary third site. So what that means is, is that as soon as the DR rubric cluster can either see its originating site or a third site, it's going to automatically start synchronizing your data back, uh, back to that site with zero operator intervention. So that means that once that data is synchronized, again, without you having to even touch a button, you can, your fail back is just an inverse of your failover, two clicks and a confirmation phrase. So what we've done here is automated every facet of not only the failover, but the fail back to make this as operationally easy to use as we possibly can. The second thing I'd call out here is what we've done from a storage efficiency perspective, because the goal of a product like mine where I'm saying I'm SaaS delivered is I don't want to have to sell you more hardware as a consequence of us being in the picture. So when we fail over between rubric clusters from production to DR and we reprotect, we know that we have that backup chain. And as I keep mentioning here, because it's an efficiency that's important in understanding our, our cores here, is that we're an incremental forever system. Because the backup chain has already been replicated to DR, when we reprotect those VMs, we know we have that backup chain and your incremental forever schema is going to persist as your application is failing between sites. Making the rubric part of the equation in terms of storage is storage efficient as we possibly can be. So we obviously put a lot of thought into how do we drive down costs and make this an easy to use solution layered on top of a, a state of the art backup solution or platform. And then lastly, um, thankfully for all of us, nine times out of 10, we're doing DR tests, not DR events. So of course the product can do DR testing and then we have complimentary compliance reporting that can be downloaded on a blueprint by blueprint basis. Talks about the steps we took, how long they took, timestamps, success and failure, participating VMs, and all the things that you would need to download, hand it to your, um, hand it to your boss or to your compliance officer and say, we are DR ready. So we're also trying to ease as much as we can the administrative burden of a DR solution as well in this, um, with this product. Great. So now that we've talked about that, let's talk about what's on top of everyone's mind nowadays, unfortunately, is ransomware attacks. So when we, like I've been um, working in uh, IT infrastructure for 20 years, and whenever I thought DR, I thought uh, tornado, flood, power outage, active God, insert here, but I think we can all agree is that what's top of mind for everybody nowadays is ransomware. Like, well, how do I protect from it, which you have uh, different layers of security to protect yourself as much as possible, but if all of those layers are to, were to fail, because at the end of the day, we can't control what our users click on, unfortunately. What, how can we give you an ability not only to make sure your data is available for recovery so you don't have to pay the ransom, but most also, how do we automate that process so that you're back online as quickly as possible? So let's talk through that a bit. Again, what if the inevitable happens? So first, let's talk about Radar, I mentioned it lightly at the beginning. It's a ransomware remediation software that learns your data set, learns your trims via algorithms, so that we can see, if we see something out of the ordinary, we can alert you. So Radar by itself is a fantastic solution. It's one of our fastest growing products here at Rubrik. But now, why don't we make it even more intuitive? You've gone through the effort of defining your business services via those blueprints. So why don't we take advantage of that and make it easier for you to triage the attack? So instead of seeing a list of VMs, what you're going to see is a list of your blueprints or a list of your business services. So it's much easier for you to understand which business services have been impacted as a consequence of this attack, which VMs are participating, so you can assess what are my next steps going to be and how am I going to prioritize. So that's number one, how do I identify the blast radius as quickly as possible? And we're leveraging the power of both radar and applos to make this very easy to assess and understand. Second part is, is when, to which point do I want to recover? How do, what point do I have available to me prior to the encryption event that was closest to the event where I can minimize data loss and get my business back online? Well, great news. Radar is going to recommend a point in time to you recover to that was pre, the re, closest recovery point to that bad behavior. But we also, again, want to automate. How do we remove human error in a very chaotic time? So when you say, yes, I would like to recover this application, Radar is going to pre-populate those points and times into app flows so that you as an operator don't have to take information from one tool and manually input it into another, introducing the opportunity for human error. 
we're automating that aspect of it as well. And the last part of it is, is how do I recover? Well, so you have two different options here. Great news, first and foremost, is that AppFlow supports local recovery. So you get the option to do a local recovery, what we call in place, meaning that we'll go and rewind those VMs to the point in time you've selected. We'll reboot them in the boot order that is prescribed in the blueprint, get that application back online gracefully and quickly at your local site. Now, depending upon what your InfoSec's response uh, process is, they may put yellow tape around your primary data center. Great news, rubric cluster on the DR side is just as immutable and available as your primary site. So that means that you also have the flexibility to fail over to your DR site and run your business at the DR site while the FBI or whomever else is doing all the assessments at your production. But at the end of the day, what we wanna do here is automate your ability to information gather, make decisions quickly, and then act upon them as quickly as possible with you know, the full amount of flexibility aligning to your business processes and business services. So that was my uh, my quick dog and pony show. Hopefully I stayed well on time here. Um, our, our mantra here at Rubric is don't back up, go forward. I thank you all for your time and I'm happy to field any questions that you may have. Great, great presentation. Wow, really, really good stuff. Uh, thank you so much for sharing us uh, sharing that with us, Carl. We do have a ton of questions for you. While we do that, I'm going to bring up this poll for everyone out there that says, uh, what additional information would you like about the rubric solution? And so uh, let's see, Carl, 30 plus questions here in the queue for you. The question is, I guess, where to start with this. Um, Mike is asking about uh, compliance and reporting and customization. Uh, what's available around that? Yeah, so reporting uh, in our in our SaaS platform is holistic for your entire rubric ecosystem. Um, I'm not sure specifically what the, what the ask is there in terms of uh, customization, but you can certainly customize the reports and the actions and events that have taken place. And then we do, of course, as I mentioned, have a um, have a canned report which you can download in a form of a PDF based on each event, whether it be an actual failover or whether it be a DR test failover. So we absolutely have customization and monitoring. Uh, but we also have that canned compliance report um, as well available for use. Excellent. And then uh, Eddie's asking about, you know, when it comes to storing the, the backup data, getting it off-site, uh, what cloud options are available there? Uh, pretty much just anything that's S3 compliant, so Azure, GCP, AWS, uh, Wasabi, or even a private data store um, from, say, NetApp or, or otherwise, we do support NFS as well. So uh, but the big three or the big four, I think we can call Wasabi the uh, low-cost solution that's available as well. We support all of them. Uh, but anything that's S3 compliant, we can archive to. Nice. Nice. Um, let's see. Another question here. Let's see. How does complexity account for the number of people required to manage disaster recovery? I think that's a key point I got from your presentation is just the efficiency of this is is that true yeah absolutely and that's why we went through a real effort i mean two, i think it's twofold one is that we've driven a ton of simplicity into backup overall um, which is a core part of our system and applos is riding on top of that simplicity if you will so again because data is being captured moved and maintained in compliance already is with or without applos applos is just layering on top of that in the same scheme of being wizard driven intuitive and always keeping in sync with the realities of your environment so We've, uh, we're, we're batting a thousand candidly on our sales calls, which I'll just speak kind of, you know, just to his side on, yes, I can drive, because a lot of times the, the people handling DR are also handling backup or handling some of their business services. Our customers are able to retask those full-time employees to other projects, other responsibilities, because it is automated in, the, um, in nature on how we handle things. So yeah, we, I, I can't give you a finite number on what we drive down in terms of people needed for DR, but we do see a trend line where we are able, where businesses are able to retask, or at least to diversify those personalities to add additional business value. Excellent. And uh, let's see, another question here. Can you use Rubrik for some assets and other DR software for other assets? Is that possible to kind of get started with Rubrik at least? Well, Rubrik, Wait, did, well, I mean, I, I'm trying to think how that would work. So we don't tie in with any other DR products, if that's the ask. Um, inherently, Rubrik does have some DR capabilities, I would say, such as the ability to turn data on live off of the appliances, um, being able to convert uh, workloads from, a, say, a VMDK to an AMI or VHD up on the public clouds. So it has some inherent capability. What it lacks is the orchestration, and that's what our product does. 
but beyond that, we don't tie in with other, any other products. That'd, uh, that'd almost be like Ford and Chevy collaborating candidly. Um, <laughs> right. So, so okay. I'll, hopefully that answers. Yeah, yeah, it does. Another question here from Mike, how much training is involved if, if you have a relatively proficient admin uh, to to administer rubric? Uh, that 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 time is super fast. Um, you, as long as you understand some fundamental concepts, such as the, what an SLA dom uh, is, well, again that backup policy, because we, again we've driven automation there. So there's no concept of a backup job in the Rico, e rubric ecosystem. Pardon me. Um, what the the concept of an SLA to give you an idea of setting it up is that you tell us how often do you want us to back up, how long do you want us to keep it, and where do you want us to keep it. And think of that as a bucket that you can throw anything into, whether it be VMs, whether it be Hyper-V VMs, whether it be SQL databases, whether it be physicals. So you're creating this logical bucket and saying to us, this is the business policy I need you to maintain. And then you can throw all of these objects in this bucket, and then Rubrik handles all the maintaining of what that bucket definition is, if you will. So the setup from an operator and administrator perspective is extremely straightforward. Once you understand how to deal with SLA domains and how to do recoveries, which are very wizard-driven as well, uh, you're in the driver's seat and you're ready to go. So there, it's a very, very short ramp. Nice. All right. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have in our live Q&A session here. There's a ton more questions for you there in the electronic queue, Carl. Uh, again, excellent presentation. Thank you so much for being on the Megacast. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's great to meet you. Absolutely, yeah. And thank you to Rubrik for supporting the event today, of course. Check out the PDF resource that's available there for download in your audience console. It provides more details on the AppFlow's automated DR orchestration solution from Rubrik. All right, and with that, it's now time for our next prize announcement. I'll leave up the poll question for everyone to respond to if you haven't yet done so. We appreciate that. The next Amazon $500 gift card, this is going out to Lucy Trim from California. Congratulations, Lucy Trim from California. And with that, it's now time for our next presentation on today's Megacast. Excited to introduce now Joe Ferguson, Cloud Sales Engineer at Clumio. Joe. Take it away. I am a cloud sales engineer with Clumio. Today's session will focus on identifying key challenges to protecting native AWS workloads and show how a transformational technology like Clumio can simplify your data protection strategy. To lay a quick foundation for the session, I'll provide a brief overview of what Clumio does. Clumio is a SaaS backup and recovery platform built natively in AWS to optimize the data protection strategy of AWS workloads. Glumio has achieved AWS storage competency status for its enterprise backup solutions. This is the gold standard designation and recognizes that Glumio provides proven technology capabilities to help customers successfully execute their storage goals on AWS. Additionally, Clumio possesses deep expertise to deliver solutions and proactively utilizes new AWS APIs to provide continuous innovation inside of the platform. As you can see from the diagram, Clumio disaggregates the control plane and data planes to enable better performance and multi-regional capabilities. Clumio deploys stateless resources that can scale to meet customer demand while using data reduction techniques to reduce your cost profile at the same time. Importantly, the stateless data processing architecture allows Clumio to use S3 direct endpoint to transfer customer data, thereby avoiding egress charges. Most customers we have found use AWS's built-in snapshot manager. It is a free tool that achieves the fundamental task of capturing point-in-time copies of these data types. But in reality, it's the same concept as an array-based snapshot in the on-premises world. This approach lacks the ability to search through an index catalog to find and restore at a file level. It also lacks the ability to secure the data against account intrusion from a bad actor unless you replicate a second copy of all your data. How does one understand how much space does a specific instance consume or understand if gaps exist for compliance purposes? This whole problem statement leaves the door wide open for an innovative modern technology to provide the path to true optimization around cloud-native data protection. This is where Clumio steps in. Clumio's creation of an authentic SaaS platform provides a modern serverless design built to scale, built to provide the utmost security around our customers' data, 
and built to simplify the end user experience and provide the best visibility around data compliance. Let's walk through a demonstration to compare the difference between AWS Snapshots and Clumio's Discover and Protect platform. To begin, let's start by identifying the most common challenges that our customers face every day. Typically, the most common data sources utilized in AWS are EC2, EBS, RDS, and S3. Let's look at an example of the complexity that is created by simply using snapshots to protect your data in AWS. I'm displaying a list of EBS snapshots in one of my accounts. I have roughly 15 instances in my account, but I have about 650 snapshots in this account. That's a lot of snapshots for only 15 instances, but it's also very representative of a basic 30-day retention policy with monthly stored for a year and yearly stored for seven years. There are three main challenges that I will call out here. One, the data shown only expresses snapshots for this account region and the specific data type. If I have multiple account regions, which I do, I have a separate list for each that I need to navigate to in order to get information. This only shows me snapshots for EBS. If I have other services such as RDS or DynamoDB, for example, I have to navigate to those lists as well. And ultimately, in order to create a global view of all my accounts, I would need to export all of these individual lists into spreadsheets and filter them there. The second challenge with this approach is that I have no index or catalog to provide any hints as to the content of these snapshots. Imagine an end user requesting a restore of a file, but is uncertain as to when the file was deleted. There is no way to accomplish this with AWS snapshots except to load each snapshot one by one into an EBS volume, mount it to an EC2 instance, search for the file. If the file is found, make sure the file is the correct version the user is looking for. And if the file is not found, remove the mount, delete the volume, and repeat the process with the next snapshot. We've had customers tell us this process could take hours to accomplish sometimes. A third note to point out is that this listing of snapshots gives me zero indication of how much space is being consumed. For each account, I receive a bill that aggregates my total snapshot footprint cost, but there is no way to drill down into that more to understand who consumes what inside of that footprint. In this list, AWS simply shows the provision volume size of the instance where the snapshot originated from. Snapshots are incremental, so they definitely are not consuming the space that's shown here. Because of all this, end users are forced to create complicated systems and processes to enforce security around their data protection strategy, keep track of compliance across multiple account regions, business units, be able to effectively report this back to the business, uh, understand and eliminate excess protection on an instance, and ultimately attempt to script and automate these processes to manage change and growth in the environment. Let's take a look at how a modern technology like Plumio addresses the same problem. The user journey starts with education through the use of Clumio Discover. Discover is a free tool that Clumio's platform provides, and anyone who wishes can go to AWS Marketplace and simply deploy it. What Discover effectively does is capture all of the metadata in customer accounts related to existing snapshot footprints for persistent data sources across EC2, EBS, RDS, and DynamoDB. We analyze the metadata and provide the customer an easy to consume dashboard that provides a ton of relevant information related to their current snapshot consumption. Let's walk through some of the key things that the tool can provide. On the top of the main dashboard, we will show you a few key metrics. The first metric estimates the monthly cost based on the current footprint that Clumio discovers. Clumio is unique in this regard as we utilize AWS's change block tracking APIs to better understand the incremental sizes of recursive snapshots. The second metric we display is a count of orphan snapshots. These are snapshots that no longer have an EC2 instance associated with them. Clumio provides additional detail on these snapshots in order to help customers understand if there is value in keeping them around. This helps solve the problem around overprotection and helps remove unnecessary cost. The third metric we provide shows snapshots that are older than 30 days. We've had customers run this report and uncover tens, sometimes hundreds of terabytes of older snapshots that could be successfully deleted in their environments. 
Lastly, we also show instances that do not have any protection at all within the last 30 days. This can help identify potential gaps in your protection strategy. These metrics are further reinforced through some additional charts below that show histograms and trends. The next tab is the Discover Footprint tab. This page allows the customer to filter through a variety of contexts to gain better understanding at more specific levels. Regional footprints, account footprints, business unit footprints, all the way down to an instance level. This is powerful descriptive information. Additionally, we created filtered lists at the bottom of the page, which provide additional detail around the instances or snapshots that we have analyzed. Our footprint history and footprint create pages show trending over time, as well as providing information about snapshot origins. The last piece of education we provide within Discover is a cost analysis tool that evaluates what it would take to create a secure air-gapped copy of all of your snapshots that exist in your account today. The assumption here is that in order to create an air gap copy, you have to replicate the local snapshot to another account, possibly within another region, and apply controls over the account. Glumio inherently provides immutable air gapped encrypted and version controlled backups of EC2, EBS, and RDS data sources. Customers that are looking to address concerns around ransomware and attacks from internal bad actors are typically most interested in Clumio's ability to prevent their backups from getting encrypted or deleted in the event of such an attack. The stateless design and our ability to reduce the data footprint through compression and global deduplication allows Clumio to offer the security advantages of Protect while reducing the customer cost profile that they would normally incur using AWS snapshots. Protect provides some very specific value propositions, which we will now explore in the next portion of the demonstration. The value propositions are built around better data security, as discussed previously, fast granular search and restore capabilities, regional data mobility, and finally, much greater simplicity and visibility around maintaining data compliance. As you can see on the environments page, Clumio allows customers to onboard accounts from any of the major four U.S. regions, as well as Canada. Further expansion is coming shortly. Protection strategies start by creating a definition of how you would like the data to be protected. We offer a simple and easy to use policy engine that describes the frequency and retention across your various data types. You can see two tabs here. The second tab is simply a layer on top of AWS backup that orchestrates local snapshots in a customer account. This is currently also a free offering within Clumio. Additionally, the policy allows you to describe what region you want your Clumio secure backups to reside in. Clumio's ability to deduplicate and compress data at the source allows us to efficiently transfer data at a minimal cost using AWS's border network to different regions within the US. Customers utilize a combined approach where they can have a local snapshot copy for a quick recovery and out-of-region backups for long-term compliance and regional availability. Once a policy is created, it simply gets applied to instances within your AWS account via tags. Clumio employs a full once incremental forever backup strategy and encrypts the data in flight and at rest in both directions, backup and restore. The value Clumio provides beyond the secure air-gapped copy is the functionality the platform enables around data access and data mobility. Let's start by looking at EC2. If I click on an instance, I can see a ton of great information about that instance. I can see all of its AWS attributes with a handy link that will bring me directly to the instance within my AWS console. I can take on-demand snapshots or backups of the instance. I can perform a global search across all of my backups for that instance for a specific file or a set of files. I can also perform the same search through a calendar view with a point and click capability through the file tree structure. If I want to restore the entire instance, I have a number of options available to me. I can restore just the underlying EBS volumes associated with the instance. I can restore the instance as an AMI, or I can use the advanced restore function, which gives me additional options. Here I can choose which region I would like to restore my data into. I can change my AMI type. I can apply other attributes to the instance as well. In short, fast, 
granular search capabilities with flexible restore options. If we look at our approach to RDS, Clumio provides some very unique, differentiated functionality here. At a basic level, we provide integrations into AWS's point-in-time recovery for up to 35 days. We also take a rolling backup copy, which is a full backup stored securely in Clumio's account. This creates a full restore point if the customer loses everything, database and snapshots. Where Clumio's biggest differentiation is shown is our use case around long-term retention of RDS instances for compliance purposes. When Clumio backs up an RDS instance, we have the ability to extract the data and the schema, insert them into Parquet files, and allow the customer to query and retrieve records directly out of the backup. Imagine no longer having a backup bound to an operating system or database engine or version. This methodology also allows customers to quickly get the information they need for an audit without having to download entire instances to simply grab a couple of records. This is most important when the databases have scaled to significant size. All of these functions in the platform are supported by a robust security policy. Clumio supports two-factor authentication, IP allow lists to route access through your VPN only, bring your own encryption keys, multi-user with RBAC and EBAC, and a comprehensive audit log that tracks every user action in the platform. This is exportable to Splunk for long-term retention if so desired. Additional reports around activity and compliance are customizable, exportable, emailable, and schedulable. Finally, we have a built-in metering system. This ensures you only pay for what you use in the platform, and to top it off, we can send your bill directly inside your own AWS bill. To recap, Clumio, through innovative design, is allowing customers to optimize and simplify their data protection strategy in AWS, improve their data security profile, and reduce their cost. Thank you for participating in the demonstration. We will now open up the floor to general questions and answers. We do have some questions for you. Um, for everyone out there in the audience, I just brought up the first of two poll questions. Uh, the, fir the first one on the screen here says, which cloud is your organization using? Select all that apply if you're using multiple clouds there, you know, out of the top four, of course. Uh, the last two would be just a single select. So, uh, Joe, let's see. First question I see here that they, they came in, um, they're asking, Mark's asking about uh, migration. You know, if someone's currently using a, another data protection DR solution, um, what's the migration process typically like to, to move to Clumio? Uh, yeah, so it, it, there's a depends answer inside of that. Um, typically, uh, most backup vendors maintain catalogs that are proprietary to that vendor. Um, and so the migration out of uh, uh, another vendor's catalog to vendor B uh, is typically something the industry hasn't solved yet on an individual level. There are some companies out there that help with historical catalog migrations or management. Um, but one interesting thing, though, if, if you're using AWS directly uh, with just their snapshot management tool, uh, Clumio is actually developing a way that we can uh, soon to be released that we can actually just rip your snapshots from your account and then index catalog, move them over to Clumio, and that way we can capture your history as well as your go-forward strategy. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, that sounds like it could be a, a great, uh, of, of great benefit to some folks out there. And then here's another question that's sort of somewhat related, but, I mean, they say, you know, I've coded up some backup scripts uh, to back up my AWS instances uh, already. Why would I want to consider or look at Clumio? That's a question we get a lot. I think the simplicity of a SaaS platform to be able to deliver predictable results is one of the main drivers. Uh, I think the visibility from the organizational level, uh, the ability to uh, report back to the organization, um, but mostly it's the global controls that you get, right? If you're creating your own scripts, you're managing these scripts at a very localized level. Um, and so you're now you're cross accounts, cross regions, plus you have ownership models around script maintenance, error control handling, fixing, all of that. Um, and so if you use a SaaS platform, it's gonna simplify the process around everything, but also at the same time, uh, and create more predictability ultimately and, and a better job of fixing things when they break. Um, 
but at the end of the day, it's the visibility, the simplicity, and, you know, the global nature of what Clumio can provide uh, in a consolidated way that is makes that solution more attractive to most people. Absolutely, yeah. Um, let's see, another question. Um, what's your take on ransomware insurance? They say, can I buy insurance to cover my costs of recover, recovering from ransomware? That's an interesting question. Uh, one of the things that we've actually found is that insurance companies around data insurance will actually inspect the environments for your different various levels of protection. And if you have a well-built, well-architected data protection strategy that includes a viable ransom protect element inside of it, you can actually reduce your insurance costs around uh, whatever policy that you have. And most companies we find actually have these policies and are looking for ways to make them more efficient and, and, and a lower bottom line. Um, and having a, a robust, uh, secure data protection strategy goes a long way. And Clumio actually, with our certifications around uh, security, our attestations around security, et cetera, um, do very well inside of that process and are well recognized inside of that process. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great, great point there. Interesting, you know, to think about. Of course, I mean, an insur a check from the insurance company is only so valuable if your company's down, you know, for an extended period of time. You want to be able to get back up and running fast. So, yeah, and you're um, paying those see. premiums as you go, right? So they're going to do a risk That's right. assessment on you. So the, the lower risk you have, right, the lower premiums you have. Absolutely. And then, you know, one of the buzzwords in the industry now is this air-gapped. Uh, so this person's asking, how can this be air-gapped uh, if it's still connected somehow to the network? I think the key around that is that the end user or the organization or the customer that's using Clumio does not contain a delete button. Uh, there is no direct access or direct line into the data or the metadata, even if you're an administrator of the platform as a customer. So the way that we hide the actual data from the customer, meaning if someone comes in and gains credential authorization with nefarious means, they can't access your data to either delete, encrypt. They cannot alter policies to delete or encrypt. They cannot do anything with historical information. So in that sense, it is a gold copy. It's air gap secured from the customer because they have no access to it. But the advantage is we're maintaining a secure environment that is operational so that you can recover if you need to. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, I'm going to move on now to our next poll. The poll responses here, it looks like 33% uh, around there said AWS is their current or primary cloud, 36% said Azure, 6% GCP, 11% another cloud, 3% um, not using a cloud today, but plan to in this next six months. So thank you everyone who responded to that. Here's another poll question on the screen, and that is just simply what additional information would you like about the Clumio solution? And let's see, we have time for maybe a couple more questions here. Um, Next one I wanted to ask you, Joe, is uh, what, what's the architecture of Clumio? Did you say this is a SaaS-only solution? Uh, yeah, so this is a software-as-a-service solution. Yeah, so we are built natively in AWS. Uh, we protect AWS native workloads. We protect VMware Cloud in AWS. Uh, we protect M365. The service is going to be expanding into Azure uh, throughout the next number of months. Um, but the advantage, again, is that there's no infrastructure required to support, to manage, to patch, to tune, to optimize, to upgrade anything. Um, you simply sign up for the service. You register with the platform. You tell the platform what you need, right? I need this frequency and retention on these instances, and we do all the heavy lifting for you. So it's really the, the best value you get out of SaaS is that you can achieve the same results or better, but you're not investing your human capital around managing, managing and operating the environment anymore. Uh, you simply just get the results and you can spend more of your time with your human capital around things that are more focused on accelerating business value, automation, uh, you know, process efficiencies and things like that. Very nice. Yeah. I like that, that architecture. And so, it looks like maybe just time for one last question, and, and that is, I mean, I, I assume since this is a SaaS solution, it would be very easy to get started. Can you kind of walk us through the process if someone wanted to test drive Clumio? Sure. Yeah, there, 
there's two ways. They can actually contact Clumio directly, but the easier methodology is you can simply go into AWS Marketplace and just download it. You get a 30-day free trial, um, and you can test out every function inside of the platform. It takes about less than four minutes to deploy and get up and running um, and start backing up data. So it's a really easy way to just get a feel for the platform itself and test out the functionality and see if it works for you. Um, and then if there's interest after you've downloaded for Marketplace, you can contact us and, and set up a long-term <clears throat> contract, or you can actually just set up a contract within Marketplace and start using it. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I was on mute there. Um, great, great uh, presentation, Joe. Thank you so much for answering all of our electronic questions here. It sounds very easy to get started with Clumio over in the AWS Marketplace. Um, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for our live Q&A, but there's some more electronic questions there for you in the queue. Thank, thanks so much for being on the event, Joe. Thank you so much. And of course, thank you to Clumio for supporting the event today. Check out in the handouts tab, there's a link there to Clumio.com, and there is a link to the uh, Get Started for Free right there on the homepage. All right, and thank you to everyone who responded to the poll. I'll leave that up while I announce our next prize winners. We have another Amazon $500 gift card going to Joe Perez from North Carolina, and another grand prize for an Apple M1 laptop. This is going to Cody Wehunt or Wehunt from Georgia. Congratulations, Cody Wehunt from Georgia. And with that, it's now time for our next presentation on today's Megacast. Excited to have back on Mr. W. Curtis Preston, Chief Techno Technical Evangelist at Druva. Curtis, are you there? I am here. Great to have Ready you back on, Curtis. Excellent. Take it away, sir. All right. Thank you very much. So for those of you uh, unfamiliar with me, I have been in the industry coming up. It's hard to Hard to say this, but coming up on 30 years, I've been in specifically in backup and recovery and disaster recovery for almost 30 years. I started my first backup job back in 1993 at what at that time was the second largest credit card company in the U.S. And through a series of events, I ended up basically specializing in this topic for my entire career. If you're familiar with O'Reilly as a publisher, I've written all of O'Reilly's books on backup. The latest one uh, called Modern Data Protection was published in May of this year. And just under four years ago, I came to Druva as uh, their chief technical evangelist. And so what I'd like to do is to talk about the way that we and you typically do both backup and DR, right? So, um, you know, we can talk about data protection. Data protection is maybe more a, a more global term that includes a number of things, including backup, disaster recovery, archive, information security, a lot of things. Today, I want to focus on mainly on, um, you know, backup and recovery and disaster recovery and how that traditionally these are done in very inefficient ways and I think that that could be done uh, in, in, in a different way. So if we take a look at this drawing, this represents the typical data protection system for a, a modern data center. And the, 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 the challenges with that, so just talk about this. So you, ha you have a backup system that is based on, you know, you, you typically buy a, some backup software from a company, you buy a backup server from another company, you buy some storage, typically some disk storage. Probably at this point, you're buying some sort of target deduplication system. And then you may or may not be replicating to another dedupe system. You also might be using tape because you tried to do disk to disk to disk and you found it um, overly uh, expensive, both from a bandwidth and a, and a cost perspective. And so you might still be using tape as your offsite DR strategy. And e even if you do have disk as your offsite copy, what you typically have is you, most companies that offsite DR copy is really just that. 
that it's a copy that they honestly hope they never have to use because the process of restoring an entire data center from a copy stored in a vault somewhere, whether that copy is on disk or on tape, is just logistically challenging is the, is the nicest thing I can say. Also, I can say that those of you that, so th there, there's probably a number of you that are listening to this that say, oh, well, we determined that, we determined that backups wasn't the way to do DR. And so we have a separate system specifically for disaster recovery. We use replication. We use some sort of snapshot and, um, you know, like a business continuance volume, et cetera. We use a co-location facility, et cetera. You use some other system because you found that your typical backup and recovery system was simply not capable of doing a disaster recovery within uh, a reasonable amount uh, recovery time objective or re and, and giving you a re reasonable recovery point objective. And the, the problem is that you have both of these systems in many cases, uh, and whether you do or do not have your DR system, you most likely have a, a DR copy and you're paying for all of these things, right? It, it's a very expensive system. You, um, you end up buying, you buy like three years worth of uh, capacity today, you, you you basically have to take a swag, a scientific wild ass guess at, at, at how much data your data center is going to have over the next three years. And you buy your data protection system today, you size it today based on your peak load over the next three years. But what that means is that you, you know, you're paying for a whole bunch of equipment that you're putting in your data center today. And you're managing and paying for that, empowering and cooling all of that today when you don't need most of it for a couple of years. And the best you can hope for is that you've oversized, because if you oversized, the worst thing is that happened is that you paid, you, you wasted some money. Because if you undersized, basically your backups end up not working, your DR doesn't end up working. Uh, but, the, but the real challenge, I think, if we talk about DR, is that very few backup and recovery systems that are on the market today are capable of a true disaster recovery, at least one with a solid RTO. And so those of you that, um, you know, as I already said, those of you that have sort of acknowledged that you end up paying for a completely separate system. And what I'd like to talk to you about is this idea of having a single system that is capable of both. So the, the really important thing that we the other thing that i think is important to understand is that the data center is no longer the center of data and you have to protect the data wherever it happens to live you may have a data center you may no longer have a data center you may have uh some data and, and compute in aws and azure and gcp you, you may have data in a number of cloud workloads you almost assuredly have some data important data stored in one or more SaaS services, right? So you're using 365, you're using Salesforce, you're using G Suite, uh, what Google, called Google Workplace now. Um, you, you have a number of these services that are creating and storing important data that also has to be protected. And then when we look at what's happening today with COVID, you almost assuredly have a remote workforce that is now working on their laptops and creating data that historically maybe you had a policy inside the building that don't put anything important on your laptop put it on the file server well that model just is completely broken now you're 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 storing data important data on a laptop that you also need to uh to protect and the the other thing is you also have to provide security across that entire world right um and and the problem is that again, the historical, typical data protection systems that are available to you, they were designed with that old world in mind where everything was in the data center. So if you're not familiar with the Druva Cloud Platform, it's powered by AWS, meaning that all of our technology runs in AWS. And honestly, that shouldn't matter to you any more than it matters to you that Netflix is run on AWS, Salesforce runs on AWS. You don't need an AWS account to use our services. Um, you uh, just, there, there is definitely, uh, it is the most uh, used, it is the most uh, tested, the platform, it has the most uh, certifications and perhaps that matters to you. We support 
uh, a number of hybrid workloads, including VMware, Hyper-V, Oracle, Kubernetes, SQL Server, all these things, Linux and Windows, physical servers, if you want to back those up as well. We also support the cloud workloads that I talked about, 365, G Suite, AWS, and endpoints as well. We always start with backup, right? Um, and everything is backed up directly to the cloud, stored on your behalf in our S3 account. That's important differentiation comparing us to many of the competitors. This is our software running in our AWS account, which is which means that when you, when you pay for our services, it's it's an all-in-one price, meaning you you don't pay for things like egress charges and other things that happen when you run other competitors software in your cloud account, your cost would be very variable. In our case, it's a, a flat fee per month based on the size of your environment. And always start with cloud backup. We do source side deduplication on everything, which means we deduplicate, de deduplicate it before we ever send it. And then we store it in the cloud. And then to that, we add disaster recovery as a service for the appropriate workload. So an example would be VMware. So if you're backing up either an on-prem VMware environment or a, uh, a VMware cloud on AWS or some, or some similar platform, we have your entire environment um, ready to go and in the cloud. And if you'd like to do DR as a service, all we have to do is, is provide you that extra service. Now, to do this, you will need a place to recover to the way we do this is we do use AWS. Now for this optional feature, you would need an AWS virtual private cloud account. And because we're going to restore that data in plain text and that needs to be your environment, not ours. But basically you, um, you do that up, you do this upfront, um, basically one-time configuration, and then we're able to provide for you uh, a, jet, a disaster recovery with a 15 to 20 minute RTO and a one hour RPO. I'm gonna talk, talk a little bit more about that uh, in a little bit. We also support e-discovery across all the workloads and a number of compliance features. And also uh, we've recently announced some really exciting ransomware recovery options. Um, we, you know, we, we notice ransomware activity, unusual data activity. We notice when um, we, we also offer scans for the malware itself. And then recently we announced this feature where um, I don't have time to go into it, but one of the problems with ransomware is that uh, that the ransomware actually is in your environment for a, on an on average 23 days, according to uh, FireEye, and it's encrypting files that, that entire time. Well, it's a real challenge to recover all those files to the most recent version without recovering any encrypted data. So you, you end up being uh, choosing to, well, I'm gonna recover to three weeks ago because that's before the infection happened, but now you've lost any data that you've created in, during those three weeks. What we're able to do is to recover the most recent version of every file without recovering any of the infected or encrypted versions with a, basically with a single process recovery. Uh, and then also, you know, we offer long-term data retention in the uh, less expensive versions of, uh, of the cloud. So you have a, a simplified and unified experience across the entire product, uh, whether you're backing up laptops, SaaS services, or hybrid workloads, you get a single console that gives you all the information that you're, you're able to use. It's super easy to get started because you don't manage any infrastructure. All of the infrastructure, all of the hard work that's happening on the back end, that's all our problem and it's all completely automated. Um, and so if you saw tomorrow decided that you're a big company and you weren't backing up, say, laptops before, but tomorrow you want to back up, I don't know, 50,000 laptops, you wouldn't have to say anything to us. You just literally install, I mean, obviously purchasing the licenses, but you would uh, just install the software, uh, the, the client agent on uh, 50,000 laptops and authenticate them with our service and the backend magic will happen that will automatically grow to meet your requirements. And then because of the fact that we've got all of your data in one place, we can do a number of things to make your data work for you. Uh, the biggest one I, I talked about that ransomware recovery, which, um, which we already, which I, I just talked about, 
We can also do things like reduce compliance risks by a number of compliance checks, looking for files of a certain type, uh, data patterns of a certain type, like looking for social security numbers and spreadsheets, things like that. And then also we do um, uh, machine learning driven storage insights. So we can tell you things like things have changed over time where you didn't used to be backing up a number of media files, but suddenly you're backing up a number of media files and you find out that uh, someone is, you know, is storing a bunch of video on your file servers that are being backed up that isn't necessary to be backed up. And so we can notify you that that trend is happening and then allow you with, with just a few mouse clicks to delete that data out of your backups, number one. So d delete it from the backup uh, history, which then saves you money. And then secondly, to automatically configure it so that that data doesn't get backed up in the future. And this disaster recovery, I think, is really important to talk about. And that is that you, you have a one-time configuration up front that obviously you can massage over time, but you do this one-time configuration up front. And then once that's done, you, um, you can either do a DR test or a, a, a full disaster recovery with literally, and I do mean this literally, a single click of the button. You click fail over and everything fails over into your virtual private cloud in 15 to 20 minutes, regardless of the size of the VMs, uh, regardless of the, the number of VMs as well, and uh, with it losing uh, only one hour's worth of data. And we can do that because of the power of the cloud, right? Because you can have 50,000 VMs and we can restore them all simultaneously because of how AWS works, right? The, um, uh, because we can literally tell AWS, please restore these 15,000 VMs. It's 15,000 separate processes and AWS just scales up automatically as quickly as we need it to, right? That's the beauty of, of designing for the cloud. It, uh, it, you know, if you're not familiar with us, we are quite a large company, over 2 billion backups a year. We've been growing 50% uh, year over year growth. And um, our, our certified net promoter score is uh, 88, which is incredibly high for uh, SaaS services and very high for uh, data protection services as well. We're in over uh, 50 of the Fortune 500 and we uh, have over 200 petabytes of data under management. We get great reviews, both from our customers and from the industry. We were recently listed as a visionary by Gartner uh, in the 2021 Enterprise Backup and Recovery Software Solutions. We were the only SaaS vendor listed in there. And uh, I think that, you know, it, it, it goes to show both our execution as well as our vision. Forrester listed as a strong performer. And I, I won't go through all of those awards, but I love the awards on the left, right? You look at the awards in terms of how well we're rated by our customers. Uh, I already talked about the Druva being a visionary in the, one of the a couple of things that they like. They really like the pay as you go pricing model. The idea is that you basically pay for the number of endpoints you're backing up or the number of gigabytes that we're backing up on your behalf after deduplication, uh, global deduplication across your entire environment. And, um, and then also they seem to like the, how many use cases that we supported, including e-discovery and ransomware uh, that I talked about already. The idea here with the Druva Cloud platform, so we do DR both for VMware and for AWS, and we're adding workloads to that as soon as we can. It, it's completely secure. The backups are all isolated, air gas, on the other side of, of the you know the best security in the planet, and the um, uh, everything is is all optimized, ready to go with an RPO of one hour uh, and an RTO of minutes. As I said, everything is completely automated. But like I said, you literally press a single button, and um, everything fails over. We also support one click fail back. That's really important. A lot of people talk about fail over. They don't talk about fail back. We also support one click fail back and an unlimited amount of testing uh, without any additional cost from us. Uh, there's a great story here from uh, Regeneron, which um, you, I'm, I'm sure you've heard Regeneron in the news the, uh, with uh, all of the work they're doing with COVID. So they have moved, um, you know, 
their workloads to us, right? And so that they've been growing continually in our environment. They're using a number of the tools that we have. They went from multiple tools and difficult processes to a single tool and um, with everything being completely automated. And um, they've lowered their, their TCO by 70%. And they also really like how quickly uh, they're able to search for files, right? So again, because everything, because we have the power of cloud behind us, we can do very quick uh, search and recovery of as many files as we need, because again, we're able to burst computing capacity and, and database capacity on the back end automatically because of how the way AWS works. Um, so if, there are a number of things. We're glad to provide a, a, a free trial. Just go to druva.com slash free dash trial. Uh, we have a TCO calculator to give you some ideas of, of what it would cost. Um, you can check out druva.com. I will also just throw in, if you're interested, I also have a podcast uh, called Restore It All uh, that I do outside of Druva, where I talk about data protection and disaster recovery and uh, a number of things like that. And with things, I'll, I'll turn things back over to David. Great job, Curtis. Uh, always an excellent presentation. Uh, we do have some questions for you from the audience. And while we do that, I'm just going to bring up a poll question. Uh, but first, I want to encourage everyone to check out the links that are there on the screen. You can actually hyper, you can actually mouse over those links and they are hyperlinks. You can just click on any and, and all of them if you'd like. Um, but uh, if we pass that slide, I also want to encourage everyone to check out the top 10 principles of a cloud backup service by Druva in the handouts tab. So uh, let's see. Poll question is now on the screen for everyone out there. We appreciate your feedback. And uh, Curtis, uh, first question I see here I was going to ask you is um, they're asking, are any healthcare companies out there using Druva? We yeah we have a, a lot of healthcare, um, both hospitals as well as, um, you know the other side. I, I, get, I don't know if you would you consider biotech healthcare. I I, I would put um, I, I put that in healthcare. But yes, we do have a number of hospitals, number of doctors and dentists and things like that. Uh, I, I think the thing that they like about it is uh, how easy it is to help them comply with things like HIPAA, and the um, the idea that they can, that all of their data is automatically encrypted before it leaves the site, encrypted again when it's stored using AES-256, using keys that they manage. No one at Druva ha ever has any access to your data, uh, regardless of, you know, even if we were, you know, the old gun, gun to our head uh, scenario, right? If, <laughs> even if somebody put a gun to our head, there's no ability, given the way our technology works, there's no ability to uh, for anyone at Druva to gain access to your data. Excellent. And maybe that uh, has kind of goes along with this question from being who says, I've heard that ransomware uh, sometimes delete the backups before uh, contacting the company. How can Druva help to prevent this type of attack? Yeah, that, that definitely happens. In fact, there are ransomware products uh, can I say that ransomware products malware? Um, it, sadly, there are ransomware products as a service. There is ransomware as a service, but there are ransomware tools that not only they, they specifically are targeting backups, right? They, they either encrypt the backups or they delete the backups prior to, and that that happens when the backups are stored either on prem in on a day, uh, you know, a server that typically has the same operating system that other servers have, but it can happen in either a Windows or a Linux scenario where if the ransomware can get into the system, it can then encrypt the, it, and, and the files are, you know, the backups are simply files sitting there on disk, then it can absolutely encrypt uh, backups. In fact, if you look at a number of the ransomware stories over the last couple of years, you would see that, um, you see this phrase and the backups were also encrypted. So yes, it is a real thing that is happening to a lot of companies, but if your data is stored in the Druva cloud platform, it is on the other side of the world, right? Um, it is behind a number of um, changes in ta technology, changes in security, a completely different company, different account, different, um, you know, 
security posture, and also stored in object storage, not in file storage. There are many, many barriers between the, the data that you're backing up on-prem and the way that we store it uh, in the cloud, which means that uh, the ransomware is unable. You, you could have the worst ransomware infection in the uh, world, and it would be unable to infect what you've stored in Druva. Excellent. Uh, Rob's asking, can Druva protect Google Workspace or Office 365 environments? So yes, uh, we do pr protect both Google Workspace and Microsoft 365, which they've renamed, uh, uh, used to call it Office 365, now they call it Microsoft 365. We protect both of those. Uh, and again, the data is always encrypted. And with that world, with the, with the SaaS world and the, the endpoint world, you're priced by the number of seats that you have and the number of products that you're backing up, right? So whether or not you're backing up just endpoints or just 365 or just Google Workspace, and then the number of people that you're backing it up with. Nice. Uh, there's a couple of questions out here. Uh, does Driva have any uh, universities as customers? Another one about law firms. Um, might be good, you think, to direct folks to the customer success stories page here. I see a, a ton of different success stories on your website. Yeah, we, we have, I mean, we are a very cross industry. The answer is yes to all those questions. We have many law firms, many um, governmental agencies, uh, as well as universities. And, um, and we have examples of all of those on our, on our customer success page. Excellent. And then uh, let's see another question here. They wanted to know where I lost it. Um, what about when it comes to backing up the cloud, is it required for the, the customer to have an AWS account? So it, it depends on what type of, what part of the cloud you're speaking of. If you're speaking of AWS, right, we do native support for backing up AWS. Uh, and we're, you know, in the process of adding native support for other cloud providers. If you're talking about AWS, obviously you would need, you would need an AWS account because that's what we're backing up is your AWS account. But, uh, and then we would strongly encourage that in this case, we're using native AWS resources. Um, we would encourage you to have a separate AWS account in a separate region. And because that's the way to comply with the 321 rule of having, you know, at least three copies on two different things, one of which is stored somewhere else. So the way to comply with that is to back that up to a separate account um, and we would strongly encourage you to do that. It's not required, but we would encourage you to do that. If, we're, if what we're talking about is backing up something like 365, then no, you do not need an AWS account. You just need a Druva account. Excellent. And then you mentioned uh, Ddupe is done on-site prior to backup in the cloud. How does that work exactly, David is asking? Yeah, so uh, it depends on what we're talking about, but just in general, the thing that we're backing up, this might be a VMware image, this might be a file, this might be a database backup. That is sliced up into individual chunks. We tend to use the word in the dedupe world. Each chunk is you know, something smaller than the thing being backed up. And then that chunk, the, the, a cryptographic hashing algorithm, it's run through a hashing algorithm, which creates what we call a hash. That all of everything I just described happens on the client. Then the hash table lookup happens in the cloud. The hash, the 160 bit value that represents that chunk is sent to the cloud. And we happen to use DynamoDB in the back end. If you're familiar with DynamoDB, that's our hash table uh, among other things. And we look up to see if that hash has ever been seen by us before, if it ha in your account, right? We don't dedupe across customer accounts just within a customer account. So if that hash has been seen before, we don't send that that chunk of data again. We just indicate that it's been stored, uh, that, you know, that we have another instance of it. So that's what we mean when we say that it's source side uh, global deduplication because everything that you back up is compared against everything else that you backed up from your entire environment to an Amazon region. When you use Druva, you do have to select which Amazon region you want to back up to, and everything that's backed up on your behalf into that Amazon region would be compared against each other. Very cool, very cool technology. All right, well, Curtis, I'm afraid we're out of time for our live Q&A. We could chat here for a long time, I'm sure. 
But um, we're going to have to wrap up the live Q&A. There's a number of more uh, technical questions maybe for you in the queue there. Curtis, it's always great to have you on. Thank you so much. Anytime. All right. For more information on Druva, I encourage everyone to fill out the poll question there, uh, respond to that, and also, of course, visit druva.com. Uh, and you can even just download Druva or uh, try out Druva in the AWS Marketplace as well. So a lot of different options to learn more and try out the Druva solution. All right, thank you to everyone who responded to the poll. It's now time to announce the winner of our next Amazon $500 gift card. This is going to John Hart of Virginia. Congratulations, John Hart of Virginia. And with that, it's now time for the next presentation on today's Megacast. This is going to be a fun panel discussion here. I'm excited to bring in uh, Zane Allen, uh, who is a Principal Technology Strategist at Pure Storage, Mark, po Mark Polin, Enablement Engineer at Veeam, and Samuel Nagalinskim, Product Manager for Technology Alliance at Cisco. Zane, Mark. Samuel, it's great to have you on. Take it away. Thank you very much, ATM, for including us in this webinar today. Today's webinar, this section of the webinar, is brought to you by Pure Storage, Cisco, and Veeam, who are partnering together on a modern solution for data protection for hybrid cloud landscapes. We have some exciting speakers today. First of all, I'm your host for this section. My name is Brian Farrar. I'm from Pure Storage. We also have Zane Allen from Pure Storage. Zane is our principal technology strategist. From Cisco, we're lucky to have Samuel Nagalam in with us. Samuel is the uh, technical alliance manager over at Cisco. And then we have uh, Mark Poland from Veeam, the solutions architect. So thank you gentlemen for joining us today. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time. So I think we're going to kick it off first with you, Zane. I'm going to go in order and talk about a little bit of data protection from the pure point of view. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, as Brian said, my name is Zane Allen with Pure Storage. Uh, first, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Glad to be joining uh, my two favorite alliances here. Um, so what I'd like to first do is talk a little bit about what we're trying to solve for here, right? We like to call this the anatomy of an attack. I think this is uh, malware, kind of what we've seen in the field, but maybe you know. You know. And what that state starts with is day zero, right? Day zero, it's a patient zero, if you will, before the attack, before they gain access. Um, and these malicious actors are trying to gain access to a network, maybe many networks. And there's several ways they do this. Um, you know, I've been involved personally when I was in IT with. Um, remote vulnerabilities, open holes in the network, maybe remote sites that you forget about. Uh, but truly what we mostly see is this, this idea of social engineering. Uh, phishing is usually the main way that this is done. Um, and in this age of the internet, phishing, figuring out how to get uh, somebody inside your network to click a link, run a script unknowingly, uh, to get that attacker access has become increasingly easier and easier. We're on LinkedIn, we're on social media. People can figure out, you know, quite literally what you are interested in, you know, and then just change things so, ever so slightly to make your, your initial reaction be to click that link, right? To run to that website, to, to get the cross scripting attack. Um, I can personally remember one, and this, this does takes a little bit back where um, I used to work for a large newspaper chain and one of our commercial sites, right? One of these smaller sites, the newsroom, uh, an editor, head editor gets, a, gets an email in, it had a bunch of bullet points of some news that was out there. And, and mind you, they had TVs facing them, but you know, they were gonna get their news from this email. Uh, and I think said something along the lines that Air Force One crashes deliberately into something. The jerk reaction is I wanna get the scoop. I need to be the first to hit this. And they click that link. Um, and if they would have gone down, I think one or two lines, there was something ridiculous about Batman in there. I mean, if they just maybe gave it a little bit of more, uh, you know, thought or, or looking into it, they probably wouldn't have clicked this link. But again, right, that knee jerk reaction, they were targeted because they specifically knew that this would might be of interest, right? That they want to get the scoop on the story. Now, luckily, in that event, this was a while back, that malware deployed pretty quickly. We saw the issue. He came and admitted it. And we were able to scrub that computer and 
far as we could see, nothing got farther than his personal machine. But, you know, this is kind of how it was. But things are changing. After day zero, right, these social engineers, they get access. And they might not even be the same people after this, right? There's just somebody really good at getting you access. Uh, they bring these malware as a service to the table. They don't even have to know how the exploit works. They just get into the network. And once they're there, what we're typically seeing now, and we see this from real cases and, and other cases in the world, they don't immediately deploy that. They sit and wait, typically 14, 50, maybe even 200 plus days, right, a year. And they, they sit and wait and they try to figure out what's critical to your data center. You know, we're past the gates now. Now we can we can sit and wait. We can try to get higher and higher into this into this network, maybe even get to that those keys of the kingdoms where we can find admin credentials. After which they identify this, they can plan their attack and what they might do with this information, how they can make it so, because ultimately they want you to pay this ransom, right? So how can they initiate things that gives you that's your only option? How do they get this money out of you, right? This is, you got to think of this kind of as a business, right? Like I said, ransomware is a service. Their intent is to get money out of you, to make you an unwilling customer, if you will. So shortly before panned, and we've seen this, they got the keys of the kingdom. Maybe they have admin. They identify where your backups are. They've seen network data going offsite to maybe something that's closing and opening, and they gain access to that. And they figure out a plan to break those backups, right? They, they're going to eventually break, uh, encrypt your data, but first they're going to figure out how to kill your defenses. So they break your backups. Maybe they've gained access to your, your snapshots. They kill those snapshots. They change those schedules. Shortly before the data is encrypted, they take care of this. And then the ransomware attack. Day the data is encrypted, they ask for a ransom. They know you don't have a way out. And you know, you might see this slowly through your network. You might see this hit all large, right? But you've noticed there's a problem. You start getting the flood of reports. You're getting help desk cases. People can't access their data. And you know you have a problem. So what do we do? Next day, you try to remediate that issue patch those systems, right? And we start that recovery process. What do we have available to us? Now we're talking about probably a large amount of data here. So in the next step, how are you gonna recover? You may have identified, you don't have those backups. They broke those backups. You don't have those snapshots, right? That fast recovery, right? I'm talking about a large amount of data and how long is it gonna take to come back? Uh, you might not have those backups. You might have to go to some other tape system, some archive system, and you're restoring data, not from an archive sense, we're not trying to go back before this attack. We're trying to go back shortly before that data is encrypted. And we're trying to bring back in a very quick and easy process. You might even have to remediate some of this data. You might have to go through and clean it. So I might have to go through several iterations of this. Like, how can I do that quickly? And if I don't have my snapshots and I don't have my backups, or I don't have a, a system that's designed, you know, a purpose, I have a purpose built appliance that maybe isn't built for fast recovery. Uh, this is going to further impact the uh, the organization. And quickly, we can remember a uh, large pipeline in the in the, uh, in the news <laughs> as of late, where you know they even found out that they paid the ransom, maybe for other reasons, and they still found out their recovery was faster. But it was going to take them days, right? And it might even take you days, weeks, or months. And you need to have a plan that lets you know that you have these backups, you have these snapshots, you have this data intact, and that you can recover quick as the business needs to and get back to work. Well, that's, uh, that is um, a kind of a terrifying scenario you paint there, Zane. Um, I'm starting to question the conversation I have going with a Nigerian prince about a fortune he wants to share with me. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and look at that email closely. <laughs> I'm still waiting for a response from the same guy. He said, let me know if he gets back to you. I will, but this is terrifying. And I got to say, I read some recent art IDC data that says that it is not if, but it is when your company is going to be attacked anymore. It's definitely and, right, yeah. We're going to see almost everybody get an attack like this within the next 12 months, according to IDC. Yeah. So with that, I want to go over to Cisco, who we're partnering closely with on uh, these solutions uh, to uh, to protect your data. And, and Samuel... I'm going to jump over and ask you uh, to take us through a little bit of the engineering work that Pure and Cisco and Veeam are doing together um, to protect that data. How do we how do we defend against the threats that Zane just talked about? So, 
Go ahead, Tim. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. And I do, uh, on behalf of Cisco, I do want to appreciate this opportunity to be to participate in this uh, data protection webinar. As you know, the the flash tag is always deployed in the in the core data center of customers running critical applications. So the data has to be absolutely secure. So the what we did was uh, what Pure and Cisco decided to partner with me to come up with a, a data protection for our flash tag solution. And, and the key objective was to be able to give the flash tag customers the, the solution that meets their needs. And so, for example, if I, if I have a flash tag customer who wants very fast restores with storage efficiency and safe mode snapshots, then, you know, then we will propose the flash, flash RAC as the solution. On the other hand, if he's just looking for fast flash restores, then we are looking at a C240 M5 all flash array. And in those rare and uh, rare instances where a customer has a large repository, you know, they could they could go forward with a S3260 storage server, which has petabyte level capacity. Now, the good news is that we have a Cisco validated design that provides details of the country of and the uh, of the configurations and the performance of all three of these configurations. So. So the, in the next slide, I'm going to share with you some of the the rigor and that we go through in developing a Cisco validated design process. The the first phase of the design process is where we define system and functional uh, system functional and performance requirements. In the next stage, we define the architecture that specifies the hardware and the software required to achieve the solution requirements. And the third phase, which is clearly the most critical, is the validation phase, where we take the system through comprehensive testing uh, and that follows, you know, typically the best practices and ensures that we achieve the scale functionality and the performance that was specified in the solution. And finally, in our, in our final phase, we actually do a very comprehensive document, which we call a design and deployment guide that, that, can, that takes the customer through every stop of the configuration. So the, the end result of all these rigor is that we have we come up with a solution which ensures a fast, a reliable, and a predictable deployment at the customer site with very minimal risk. And to add to that, the in case the customer has any questions or in the rare and remote scenario where you might have you might run into an issue, you have one number to call the Cisco Technical Assistance Center, or what we call the Cisco TAC. And it's a 24 seven support services. And they actually are quite familiar with these configurations. So they can immediately help you resolve in the event of an issue. So that's what we have with our Cisco validation design process. And another point that I want to also share with you uh, in the next slide is the is that these configurations, the flash tag configurations, we have what is called the Cisco InterSight, which manages both a UCS, the compute, the UCS server, as well as the pure storage all flash array. So in essence, we can manage the entire flash tag solution from a single pane of glass. And and Actually, we also can orchestrate the entire the flash tag configuration with automated workflows and tasks that are available in InterSight and actively manage these configurations 
So it makes life easy for all, for our customers uh, when they are when they uh, deploy the flash tag data protection solution. And with that, I would like to give it back to you, Brian. Thank you. This is, um, I appreciate the update on the CVDs. Um, I, I've seen some of these documents and and you're right. If you follow these to the letter of the document, you're going to get to green lights as efficiently as possible. I will also say about Intersight, I just read a wonderful IDC report, which I pulled off of Cisco's site, in, in which they um, talk about Intersight and the role in the new flash stack architecture and how um, Intersight basically leapfrogs the competition and gives uh, Cisco and UCS first mover advantage over customers. And that was independent IDC research. So I encourage you to go up to Cisco's uh, website uh, about UCS and uh, take a look at that IDC report. So thank you very much, Samuel. And I think next our final speaker today is from Veeam and Mark Poland from Veeam. I'm gonna turn it over to you and ask you to take us home. Thank you, Brian. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to present uh, the Veeam story here. Uh, Zane talked about, really framed up the problem uh, of ransomware very well. Uh, it, it's not if, it's when. It's going to get through. Uh, so how are you going to recover from that, right? Samuel talked about the the compute and storage environments with the flash stack validated design uh, with data protection with Veeam, right? So you understand kind of all the ingredients that go into this now. What I would like to talk about and start out with is good news about ransomware. And you may have never heard good news about ransomware, uh, but I can tell you that if you have a tested validated or planned and validated ransomware recovery plan, you can actually recover from a ransomware event with minimal disruption to your operations. And there are two critical elements to that ransomware recovery plan. The first one is, and, and Zane framed this problem very well, the ransomware, which is typically hacker assisted, is going to go after your backups. Well, it can only actually get to vulnerable backups, right? So the backups need to be non, not invulnerable, I guess is the word there, right? So they have to be valid, usable backups that are safe from the attack so you can recover without making crime pay and uh, enriching these uh, criminals. The second thing, which is equally important, is you're not just gonna be recovering a file directory or a database or one of anything, you're gonna be recovering terabytes, maybe tens to hundreds of terabytes of file data, database data, application data, so you need storage platform that can drive that very high speed recovery. And if what we'll see in the next slide is you also need very complete ransomware protection. And with Beam data protection, with Cisco compute uh, platforms like the flash stack, like UCS, with pure uh, flash array, X on the primary side, C on the, the backup side, you will get that. So everything from the pre-breach through the post-breach will ensure that you've got the key elements of that ransomware recovery plan. So before the breach, I just mentioned a few of these quickly, uh, early detection, right? possible ransomware activity alarm is what we call this. So the behavior on the production machine, it becomes uh, like what you would see in an encryption event. So we can go ahead and raise the alert. We can even go ahead and take action. A very common action is shut the network interface down so that you contain that breach. 
The other one is Veeam knows about the size of your backup files, right? You take one full backup initially, and then from then on, it's an incremental approach. And so if the incremental changes size dramatically because of an encryption event, for instance, we can raise that alarm as well, right? And also take action on any of these alarms. Uh, the final thing before the breach is you should be not only getting a backup valid, you know, that a report that says your backups are valid, you should also be testing the recovery of those backups, right? A recovery validation test and the associated uh, report that goes with that. We call that sure backup. So that's all before the breach. Once the breach happens, uh, you need you need to make sure those backups aren't vulnerable, right? And we take a belt and suspenders approach uh, here. We leverage Veeam's immutability with the hardened Linux repository that leverages native Linux immutability for on-premises. And then we also leverage those safe mode snapshots of the backup storage. So if somebody went in and was somehow able to destroy or delete the Veeam backups, you can recover those from snapshot very quickly and begin your restoration. Uh, and then as far as restoration, right, it has to be very high speed. So Veeam has recovery tools, which we are well known for, like instant VM recovery, uh, instant disk recovery. I could I could go on. I don't have all the time in the world, so I'll just leave it at instant recovery for critical workloads. Uh, you, we've got that secure restore capability, and what that does for you is you need to scan using your anti malware antivirus tools to make sure that you're not reinfecting this newly cleaned environment, right? So. You need to have that ability to do the scan in a isolated network quarantine network environment before you recover on to production. So with that, Brian, did we get any questions? I think we did. And thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank all the speakers. Um, we do have questions. As I like to say, the phones are ringing off the hook. <laughs> um, so uh, let me let me take a look at some of the questions that come in on the uh, the Q and A uh, screen. Um, well, let's go in order since they kind of came in order. This one's for you, Zane, at, at Pure. Okay. Uh, you, know, you you scared the crap out of us with the anatomy of an attack. Um, but, but Mark saved but us. Then, um, <laughs> uh, Cisco and Veeam made us feel a little bit better. So thank right. you very That's much right. for that. Um, but one of the things that uh, Mark talked about uh, from a uh, from Pure's perspective are these safe mode snapshots. Can you explain what a safe mode snapshot or an immutable snapshot is for us? Sure, absolutely. Um, so first, mutability is a term we hear a lot. It means a lot of different things. Snapshots are immutable by nature, can't change them. Uh, what we're really talking about here though is the, I, I like to call it the resiliency. Um, that snapshot is there when you need it, right? As, as, as Mark was just outlining. Pure has a, Interesting mechanism always has. So that's like one thing to note. Safe mode is really just a snapshot with this extra on top of it, if you will. Uh, it has this notion of once you delete a snapshot, if you go to manually delete one, it sits into an eradication bucket and it sits there for a period of time. It's 24 hours uh, by default. What safe mode does is it first, it takes that and allows you to extend that timer out, right? Uh, usually we see maybe seven days, maybe 14 days. So that even though you delete it, it sits in this eradication and can't go past that stage. Second, it puts in a mechanism where customer actually arranges with support. Um, and there's a, there's keys that are established, pins that are established that actual human beings from the organization, usually maybe outside of the uh, IT org, have to enable it. And they have to be there, you know, to turn the keys, if you will, kind of think of like two different keys um, to change that schedule. So no one, even with admin credentials can change that schedule and thus making sure those snapshots are there when you need them. Really easy to implement. And again, it's just a snapshot with this, this robust uh, uh, resiliency built around it. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, very uh, nuclear sub-like. 
Exactly. <laughs> I really, <laughs> oh, that, I mean, that makes got to break sense. the code. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's, uh, and I want to thank our guests today for this part of the program, Cisco, Pure, and Veeam. Thank you guys very much for joining us. And I hope everybody out there has a wonderful day. Keep your data safe. <laughs> All right. Great discussion there. Thank you so much again to our experts from Pure Storage, Veeam, and Cisco. I've just brought up a poll question for everyone on the screen that says, what additional information would you like about this joint solution? And I'll leave that up there. I'm afraid we're out of time for our live Q&A session. We answered all the questions we had there on the panel, uh, all the questions we had time for, I should say. But we are routing all the remaining electronic questions over to the Pure, Veeam, and Cisco teams. So thank you for all the excellent questions. Don't forget about our best question prize as well. Of course, for each one of our Q&A sessions, we're doing another Amazon $50 gift card for the best question from each session. So don't forget about that. And again, I will leave up the poll for everyone to respond to. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, we definitely want to know or you know, just additional information. And I'll leave that up while I announce our next prize winners. So we have another Amazon $500 gift card. This one's going to Melissa Evans from Missouri. Congratulations. And our next grand prize for an Apple M1 laptop, this is going out to Kevin Hanlon from California. Congratulations, Kevin Hanlon from California. I'm excited now to introduce Mr. Jeff Dickey, Chief Technologist for Cloud and Data Services at NetApp. Jeff, it's great to have you back on the event. Take it away. NetApp helps you unlock the best of Google Cloud, and today I'll be talking about disaster recovery and backup with Google Cloud, VMware Engine, and NetApp. My presentation is broken up into three categories. First, NetApp and Google Cloud, then use cases, and finally, how to get started today. I'm Jeff Dickey, I'm the Chief Technologist, and I'm in the office of the CTO here at NetApp. I've been focusing on cloud since 2009. I actually worked with Google Cloud in the beginning and was their first partner. This is a picture of me on stage speaking at the Kubernetes 1.0 release announcement. Let's jump in and talk about the partnership between Google Cloud and NetApp. NetApp is the world's number one data storage operating system with 35,000 customers in every major industry. We're extremely proud to be a Google Build partner and we're also a VMware uh, global partner. We're very unique in the industry being 27 years old holding around 2,800 patents, and we offer multiple ways to gain enterprise storage and data features at Google Cloud scale. We've also won the awards in 2018 and 2019 for being Google's Technology Partner of the Year, and we're also heavily invested in VMware with thousands and thousands of customers using NetApp to host their VMware virtual machines and vSphere environments. If you remember back to the early days of VMware, NetApp revolutionized what could be done in virtualized environments by bringing snapshots, thin provisioning, dedupe, snap clone, and a whole host of other amazing features and technologies that push forward widespread adoption of virtualization. When you're helping move some of the largest and most complicated on-prem environments to cloud, you quickly learn that one size does not fit all, and Google Cloud is solving this big problem with Google Cloud VMware Engine. This is an ideal service because it's the best place to run VMware workloads and you get the flexibility and power of connecting your VMware instances to Google Cloud services and leverage their state-of-the-art security and network with their global backbone. Additionally, you can instantly connect to the AI and ML capabilities, which are known as best in the industry. Now let's talk about how cloud-based backup and disaster recovery is growing and how GCP with NetApp accelerates recovery time with cloud-based backup and disaster recovery. Business continuity planning is a necessity for enterprises. Complexity in our application environments are on an upward curve and we're never going back. Our attack service keeps growing and the number one way we are held hostage with ransomware is from people, not technology. Not all apps and data are created equal and we need the flexibility to have unique RPOs and RTOs, which again can add complexity. In a recent Logic Monitor study, they noted that companies with frequent outages have 16 times higher costs than those with fewer instances of downtime. 
This really highlights the magnitude of costs brought by not being properly prepared for an outage. And when you're paying this much for outages, you can never catch up or repurpose budget for innovation and automation. It's also a downward spiral because outages lead to brand mistrust and less users or customers, which also reduces your company's revenue. The study also tells us the average cost of downtime per minute is $8,851. Let's say a critical application is down for an hour. That's $531,000. What else could you have done in your business with $531,000? And finally, the study says 55% surveyed said cloud has a role in their data protection strategies. Are you in the 55%? Let's go over data protection and some of the goals that you might have. First, you want to protect against data loss because data is the lifeblood of an organization. It's the intellectual property of the business and what differentiates you from your competitors. So you need multiple copies in strategic locations. You need to protect from threats, not just from the outside, but the inside too, especially the inside, whether malicious or not. You also must prevent application, site, or availability zone downtime, and this downtime can happen from many other ways beyond data loss. Let's go over some examples that drive the need for data protection. Regulatory requirements are on the rise and different regions have multiple variations. Business policies and data liabilities. Data corruption is something that can cause massive outages. Complexity is on an exponential curve, which makes the rise of human errors rise at the same time. And this goes hand in hand with cyber attacks and ransomware. Let's not forget about natural disasters. Whether you believe in global warming or not, you can't deny that weird things are happening and more of it is happening. Roads, cities, and basic infrastructure was built in a different time. We need protection from the unknown that the future brings. There are things that will happen that we can't comprehend in today's environment. Even carefully planned upgrades can cause major, major outages. Remember when Verizon sent a big chunk of internet traffic through uh, a steel company based in Pittsburgh, we couldn't get into internet giants like Facebook, Amazon, and a ton of others. This was a tiny misconfiguration done by a small ISP that resulted in almost three hours of downtime for many companies. If we go back to our downtime cost per minute of $8,851 times three hours is almost $1.6 million. Yikes. With GCP and NetApp, you have multiple ways to archive backup and provide application disaster recovery or even site disaster recovery. We covered data protection. Now let's talk about how Google VMware Engine or GCE is simply the best way to migrate your virtual machines into cloud. Google is the best place to run VMware workloads in cloud because it's a fully owned and operated service from Google Cloud. You access it the same way you access any other Google Cloud Platform service, by going to the console at cloud.google.com. It's also fully certified in partnership with VMware. You have the assurance that your workloads that run on-prem in a VMware environment will run the same or even a better state in Google Cloud VMware Engine. This is a dedicated private cloud environment that gives you the best of both worlds so you can keep your same operational practices and current technology stack as you would on-prem, but also have access to the additional native cloud capabilities that exist in Google Cloud, like the leading uh, data analytics or the best AI and ML capabilities. The strategic partnership between Google Cloud and NetApp really shines when you look at specific use cases like disaster recovery and high availability. By using NetApp and Google Cloud VMware Engine together provides a compelling cost benefit of 20% or more compared to having an on-prem DR solution where you have to maintain additional data centers. Because this is an on-demand service, you can spin up and spin down your private clouds as needed and pay as you go. You don't have to run, pay for, or maintain additional on-prem data centers just in case of an outage. This is also a fantastic way to burst capacity when needed. Being resource constrained for applications can also cause applications to be unavailable. The key part is how you can now leverage all the benefits of cloud volumes on tap with Google Cloud VMware Engine. You can now replicate your on-prem VMware environment to GCVE. You can scale your storage independently from your compute and be assured you're backed up at all times. You could also now have a zero footprint disaster recovery by replicating your on-prem production environments to GCVE and connecting it to your cloud volumes on tap data. When needed, 
you simply fail over to your zero footprint DR environment. And the beauty is you're not paying for your physical locations and you get to truly enjoy the benefits of cloud by paying for only what you use. So if you're one of NetApp's 38,000 customers and you're running vSphere environments, we bring incredible capabilities and you're able to start using this right away. Let's go over some of the benefits of using cloud volumes on tap for Google Cloud. If you're not familiar with NetApp's ONTAP data management software, it's consistently stated as the enterprise block and file storage. You get full control over ONTAP and all of the enterprise features that enterprise applications require in the cloud. It's a self-managed storage service that deploys on native Google Cloud resources and consumes Google Cloud services. Pay per use just like native cloud services and it's available right from the marketplace. NetApp ONTAP is supported in every Google Cloud region, so you're able to use this wherever you're using Google Cloud services. And it's deployed using NetApp Cloud Manager, which gives you a single pane of glass view to not only your cloud storage, but also your on-prem storage as well. And you don't have to be an expert to deploy CVO. You just need to be able to follow a web-based interface and you can get up and running very quickly and start replicating your environment into GCBE. Cloud storage has been available for well over a decade, but for the first time, we're able to bring a suite of enterprise features together with the scale and performance of public cloud. Cloud volumes on tap can be customized to fit specific production level applications. CVO offers increased storage high availability and support for dual protocol of Linux and Windows. It supports both NAS and SAN from the same instance without having to re-architect your storage and applications. Data storage is independent from VMs, so no need to add compute resources for additional storage capacity. And we have enhanced security with customer managed encryption keys and encrypted volume policies. You also get rams ransomware protection and recovery and anti-malware integration with NetApp Cloud Insights. Through our unique machine learning algorithms, we can automatically detect malicious data access or anomalies and automatically create snapshots to object store using Worm with our snap lock technology so that the data and your VMDKs are protected and are unable to be written to. This goes hand in hand with data protection and application availability. With auto scaling, there's no need to over provision storage resources. Only pay for what you need and get thin provisioning of your volumes in the cloud. An example, if you provision a 20 terabyte volume and you start writing to it, you're only gonna pay for 500 gigabytes of actual persistent disk consumption. And then we're going to run deduplication on top of those savings. With our space efficiency technologies, you're going to get super efficient snapshots and you only pay when you are writing extra data to the snapshots. In addition, we're able to tier cold data to object storage for even more savings. Multi-tenancy gives you centralized governance over multiple workloads at multiple locations, including on-prem. And finally, with cross-zone and cross-region replication, you have complete data mobility. With SnapMirror, you're able to mirror your data to the cloud and further replicate data to multiple regions. With this type of data replication, you can easily create disaster recovery solutions in Google Cloud with, a simple, with simple and fast recovery options. When you add NetApp Cloud Data Sense, you're able to quickly find personal identifiable information in your data volumes or snapshots. You can also use Cloud Data Sense when backing up to cloud volumes on tap so you can know exactly what type of data you're moving to the cloud. So now that we've covered the technologies, let's go over the use cases. The three main use cases we're gonna talk about is first, disaster recovery on demand. That's the zero footprint DR, where you can spin up disaster recovery on demand and it drastically reduce cost. Second is around VMware environment backups. This is backing up VMs to Google Cloud Storage for air-gapped backups to protect them from ransomware, data loss, and cyber threats. And third is virtual desktop infrastructure protection. Backup and DR for on-prem virtual desktop software like Horizon and Citrix. Backup user data and workspace profiles, recover compute and file shares in minutes and maintain user productivity during any type of disaster outage. So how does Zero Footprint DR work with VMware and CBO? You first browse to Cloud Manager 
and in a few clicks, you have your CVO instance ready to go in the region you've selected. Then you add your on-prem NetApp filer to Cloud Manager using a wizard. Now you simply add a snap mirror relationship between your on-premises filer and your CVO instance in Google Cloud. You can replicate asynchronously or on a schedule, and this is block level deduplication over the wire. Any changes are being replicated at the block level in real time. Now when you need to test failover for compliance or actually run production in DR, you simply attach your vSphere environment to your CVO instance, which will look just like a VMware data store. And now you can boot all the necessary VMs and they're instantly available to continue running your applications or your entire business. You can also vMotion into your vSAN environment to get even higher performance out of your uh, vSAN and add data protection. Not only is this incredibly effective for disaster recovery, but this is also a great way to migrate production on-prem workloads into Google Cloud. It's simple and easy to automate backups and DR in Cloud Manager. On the left, you'll see green tags. These are CVO instances in Google Cloud. The blue tag is your on-prem NetApp storage. You simply click on the on-prem device, then drag it over your CVO instance in GCP, and that creates a relationship. Now you can begin syncing any or all of your data in real time. Once you've synced your data into Google Cloud, you can then create a backup policy and send backups to Object Store. We also offer Cloud Backup Service, which is the ability to back up your on-prem data to the cloud or send snapshots to Google Cloud. With snapshots, you'll be able to protect against data corruption or human error. They're instant, very fast, and they're non-disruptive. We, we also offer application consistent snapshots for SQL, server, and, and other databases. For DR, you're able to spin up instances to connect uh, uh, to the replicated data to avoid any downtime in any type of outage or natural disaster and save cost by minimizing your footprint outside of outage windows. Instead of backing up directly from the production data, you can create a backup from the DR copy. And this way you eliminate any risk of, of impact on the production data performance. This scenario uses Cloud Volumes on Tap built-in backup service, which is activated via Cloud Manager to reduce the risk of data loss, protect from ransomware, and to meet regulatory requirements. Backups are saved to Object Store to help reduce costs, and so you can have a longer retention of data sets. And because Google Cloud Object Store is the fastest in the industry, recovery time is very quick. The last use case I'll talk about is high availability for your Horizon or Citrix VDI environment. You can apply everything I've talked about today to your virtual desktops. So desktops on-prem running on vSphere can be set to replicate with snap mirrors so you can instantly get back all of your data stores, your Windows servers, guest file shares, and your user profiles. Now you can protect your users against accidental overriding of their shares or clicking on viruses. All of their user profiles and file shares can be backed up to object store via policies that you put in place. We're seeing an incredible uptick with virtual desktops in the cloud, and this is going to give you the flexibility, control, and the protection you need. So how do you get started today? Simply log into Cloud Manager at cloud.netapp.com and receive a 30-day trial for Cloud Volumes on Tap. And that wraps it up for me. Great presentation, Jeff. I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Uh, you ready for some Q&A? Absolutely. All right. Um, for everyone out there in the audience, I just brought up the poll question on the screen that says, what additional information would you like about the NetApp solution? Of course, we appreciate your feedback on that while we take your questions. Um, let's see, first question that came in here, Jeff, I wanted to ask you about is, I, they want to know, is this solution compatible with Google Cloud Object Storage? Oh, yes, absolutely. What a great question. Yeah, so, you know, as everyone knows, uh, cloud storage from Google is Object Store, and Object Store is the, is the perfect place for, you know, unstructured data and, and backups, and what a, what a perfect way for this integration point from, you know, what we do with, with cloud volumes on tap and on-prem, and we have these, you know, connection points that make it real easy to back up your data from on-prem into 
uh, Google Cloud Storage, um, and also because uh, since we have optimized and virtualized um, our on-tap uh, operating system, you know, it's, 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 been, it's been really you know, performance optimized in GCP, and because it's on tap, you get all of those features as well. So, you know, you're also going to be able to do backups, um, point in time copies, uh, right to object store to keep those costs down. And to, you know, my favorite thing is, is really um, uh, keep longer retention of data since we're able to kind of help lower those costs. Um, and, and again, with, with snapshots, you know, you're not paying for uh, uh, extra unless you're writing to these snapshots. So it's a great, great way for uh, the capabilities and the, the connectivity and connections that we have with, with Google Cloud Storage. Very cool. Yeah, it's, it's great to have all those different options available. Um, next question they say here, copying data from on-prem to the cloud needs performance. How does NetApp meet the performance demands for that? Yeah, so that's another, another great question. So it's, it's interesting that, you know, when we're, we're, we're still doing backups, uh, you know, the same way we've, we've been doing backups for decades. And this, this really takes a toll on your applications, uh, on your, your, your virtual servers, instances, everything, because it increases that kind of the I.O. load. Um, it really negatively impacts performance, and it's kind of, kind of a drag, right? We're always kind of indexing and, and doing these backups. You know, I think the, the, the better way, the future way, is um, by doing, uh, you know, block level uh, uh, copies and, and looking for those changes and copying that from a block level so you're not having an impact to your, your infrastructure. You're not having an impact to your, your production applications in the cloud or on-prem, and you're able to, again, you know, restore faster and, and do single file restore. Everything that you need becomes faster, and you can actually save costs on compute because you're not having to uh, you know, add additional uh, uh, I.O., to your, your workloads. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that's smart. I, I love the, the new way here we're talking about of doing backups. Um, you know, like you said, we've been doing it uh, for the same way a long, long time. So this is smart, very smart. Um, next question, uh, they want to know, does this solution work for on-prem data? Uh, what about data stored in Google Cloud as well? Or only work for on-prem yeah, data? Yeah, yeah. So it works, yep, obviously it works for on-prem with our cloud backup service, and you're able to do, uh, you know, all of the wonderful things. But, again, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned before, because it is virtualized on tap, you know, you're able to uh, use all of those same features. You're able to back up from cloud volumes on tap to object store. Uh, and, and, and better yet, you're able to really control the policies and how you're doing those backups and when and for how long. Um, and, and, and again, you know, you're able to, to tier that data, um, which, you know, everyone sees that 80% that of data is usually cold no matter what. So all of those things are, are, are built in, um, and you can, you can back up and restore and use uh, Google Cloud um, VMware Engine for, for DR um, and, and using Cloud Volumes on tap. Got it. Okay. And then with the architecture here, they want to know where does the backup data actually reside and who controls that data? Yeah, so, so the backup data is in uh, Google Cloud Storage. And, you know, Google offers this amazing, you know, inexpensive storage. You know, it's, it's really that infrastructure of the service. Um, but you control all of that data, how it's you know, managed, what you're doing, the control over that data and that governance, um, you, you get to control that. And um, so you're going to get that flexibility uh, for being able to do what you want with that and be assured that everything is backed up, you're able to restore, you're able to meet those uh, RPOs and RTOs. Um, so it's, it's really important that, that you know, you, you own your data, right? But the, but the data is, is, is not natively backed up in, in Google Cloud, but you're able to do that, and you're able to have, you know, really fast restores because, again, um, you know, Google Cloud Storage is, is extremely fast. Uh, I think it's probably the fastest object store out there. So when you are backing up, uh, you're able to restore extremely fast. Excellent. All right. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for our live Q&A. Um, let's see, Jeff, you do have some, some fans on the event today here. Trent said they love, love, love NetApp. The NetApp is so awesome. Uh, so that's always great to hear. If folks want to get started with Thank this, you, uh, you, 
<laughs> you said uh, go to cloud.netapp.com. Is that right? Absolutely. Get started there. Excellent. All right. Well, great presentation again, Jeff. Thanks for being on. Hey, thank you. And for more information on NetApp, don't forget to check out the Handouts tab there. It's there that you can download a resource. Uh, this is actually an ebook entitled Disaster Recovery in Google Cloud with Cloud Volumes on Tap. So make sure that you check that out. All right, and I'll leave up the poll question while I announce our next prize winner. We have another Amazon $500 gift card. This one going to Aaron DeFratis, DeFratis from Illinois. Congratulations. And with that, it's now time to introduce you to our next presenter on today's Megacast. I'm excited to welcome Jeff Long, Senior Solutions Engineer at SunGuard Availability Services. Hey, Jeff, it's great to have you on. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So, yeah, take uh, it away. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, and, and folks, thank you for the time uh, and allowing, uh, allowing us to present uh, on this Megacast. Really appreciate it. Um, as we go along here, um, kind of the, the, the key for this is I, I want to kind of focus in on why resiliency matters in the marketplace today. Okay. Now, we've all you know we've all heard about you know uh, you know resiliency and all that stuff, but why does it really matter? So I'm gonna the next few minutes I'm gonna take you through and kind of walk you uh, walk you through this. So um, as we uh, walk through this here. Let me see if I can build out this slide here. My apologies. Um, let's see. So I want you to think about challenges here. Okay. What I mean by challenges is we're in a hybrid IT environment. Whether that's physical and virtual, you have the big iron in the back of the data center. If you're going from on-prem to Azure or what have you, we live in a hybrid world. Okay. Now, if you Kind of look at it, right? There's, you know, you could do it as a service, right? You could do it, or you could do it by yourself, right? But when it comes down to a solution, right, you want a provider like ourselves to walk you through that 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 process, right? Kind of go through and you know do these DR plans, right? Do you actually have a good DR plan, right, for the physical and virtual environments or wherever you live, right? Do you actually have the ability to ensure that the data that you have and want protected can also be recoverable, okay? And, you know, you want to also be able to test this, right? Because, you know, you can have a good uh, good DR strategy, but are you testing it? Okay, that's one of the big things you want to, you know, want, want to talk about here and think about this, right? Now, um, as we move further along, right, what's driving the needs here? to improve your DR capabilities. Now, we all know we live in an online world, right? Uh, whether it's, you know, like my daughter orders her latte in the morning so it's ready for her to go as she's going to college, right? Online banking, right? You name it. We're online. Now, if you can't stay online, what's the first thing that happens if someone can't get to the website? Either internal or external, right? Because we're IT. We have internal customers, our workers and then our, our our clients. So if they can't do their job or they can't order their latte, I don't want to make it a little simplistic with the latte, but online banking, if they can't get there, what's the first thing that's going to happen? It's going to get tweeted. It's going to get put here. Oh, I can't do my banking or I can't do this and that. Right. So how do you stay online and competitive? Right. With that, right, you want to improve the availability of these applications. Okay. Now how do you do that? Right, because the biggest thing here is the cost of downtime. Now, there's also there's the financial cost of downtime, as we all know, but there's that reputation, right, that actually can impact even greater. Now, these numbers came out from Gartner and Forrester, right, and these were some of the top ones when they polled their customers of what's driving the needs to improve their DR. Okay. Now, as we move forward. Why would you want to do your cloud recovery and backup with us? Okay, you know we've been in the market for 40 plus years. You know we know how to do this, right? We're not the new kids on the block. Um, we've been doing this for a long, long, long time, um, and because of that, we're actually honored to be recognized in Gartner's uh, guide for DRAS. Um, I'm not going to 
uh, go over the entire press release. If you'd like to, I know these slides will be available later on. Um, I invite you to go ahead and read it and then contact us if there's any other questions on that. Uh, but please do um, go ahead and, and uh, um, look up this link. Now, when you partner with us, um, you know, you're not just you're not just a customer, you're actually one of our partners. You know, um, you know, we take that to heart. Uh, but what's actually included, right? And I call this kind of like, you know, our quadrant here of uh of what's included with our services. So we're gonna give you the technology components. What is that? We're gonna give you the licenses and obviously the target infrastructure. Okay. We're gonna design and implement these solutions with you and your teams. We're not just going to hand you uh, the software and say have at it. We're there for you. There will be a team behind uh, behind you to actually from SunGuard to help you discover and design these recovery plans. Okay, as you know, it's not just as simple as hitting a button and you know VMs or infrastructure lights up on 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 the DR side. There's more to it than that. But well, we're going to help you with those. Once that's implemented and you're in what's called steady state, we're going to actually go through life cycle management. We're going to monitor the replication, we're going to monitor the environment, and we're going to go through you know, change in incident management. You'll have upgrades throughout the life cycle of that service that you sign up for. Most importantly here, in, and you know, again, we'll talk about it in the services we're going to talk about here, uh, in, in the next few slides is test execution, right? Again, just because you have a, just because you actually have DR doesn't mean that it actually works. You have to test it. So with these, with these uh, services that we would provide, you're going to get a yearly test at a minimum, and then some of our uh, uh, services actually have monthly testing with verified results, okay? And heaven forbid that you actually have to go ahead and declare a disaster. Now, it's, as you guys, as you folks know, it's not just a natural disaster right now. It could be, uh, you know, whatever it is. Is it ransomware or what have you? We're there every step of the way to get your business up and running so you can refocus and actually get your issue resolved, okay? So I want you folks to keep that in mind as well. So we talk about hybrid IT, okay? Now, our services are fully managed and monitored, okay? We offer tiered RTOs with SLAs. Now, when I talk about tiering, it's not tiering on back-end infrastructure. It's tiering on the service that we provide to our customers and our partners. And they're SLA backed and they're financially backed SLAs, which is unique in this space. They're also scalable. So, you know, we talk about scale up, scale down, but what I'm talking also is about financial scalability as well. As your business transforms, we'll transform with you. Meaning that the service that you sign up with us day one, maybe your business may, may uh, change and, and transform three years down the road. So that service you signed up for during that cycle may change. We'll change with you. One of the services I'll show you here as well is we actually have very, very quick recovery. It's two VMs a minute. Okay? And then mostly mostly here, you know, the most important, it's all with managed GR testing. Okay? So we talk about the tiers here. Now, we have our DRAS and we have our backup tiers. So with the DRAS offering, we have our RPO of 1 to 15 minutes. And then we have tiered SLAs for the infrastructure, bringing up your applications. Okay, so that's, you know, every, you know, for the first tier one, it's two hours, four hours, eight hours, and so on. A backup of recovery also has SLAs and SLOs, depending on the size of the environment. Again, these are financial backed SLAs. We can cover physical clusters, virtual machines, 
And then we also have flexible payment options as well, right? So we can either do a monthly or a pay-per-use option. Think of that as like the Azure or AWS where you only pay for it when you use it. Pay for the storage, but then when you actually declare, that's when those, those usage fees kick in. Again, unique in this environment and this space. So how we deliver this managed recovery. So we'll get, you know, when you partner with us, we're going to go through an exercise of defining your businesses, RPOs and RTOs, and actually tying them into our services. Okay? And you can mix and master tiers. You can mix and master products. It doesn't matter. We're, again, we're going to deliver you a solution, not point solutions. We're going to give you a complete solution. So with the recovery time with these RTOs, right, it's kind of equals the time taken by the technology, right, whether it's the, our, our CRVS solution is powered by Zerto or our VM solution. We're going to give you a recovery RTO of two VMs per minute, okay? Other providers stop here. Okay? They're going to give you that, okay, here you go, here's the keys of the kingdom, have at it. Where our SLAs are different, is that we actually, if something doesn't come up, we need to step in and try to debug and identify the failure, what triggered the failure, and, and remediate it. All right, so we need some time to validate, time to debug. This is where our SLAs are wrapped. So from that previous chart that I showed you, the multicolored chart, the two hours, four hours, and eight hours, right, this is, this is where this actually sits in. This is where the SLAs are, are, are the financial back SLAs are, are structured. Okay. Now, I talked about testing and the importance of testing. Now, when we talk about that, you know, I, I say that you know a successful test, yeah, that's a su successful test. But a failure of a test is not necessarily a bad thing. That's the way I look at it. That's, an, that's a way to improve, okay? Now, what I mean by that is that, you know, say, for, for instance, you do your yearly tests and you have a failure. Okay, well, that's, that's an opportunity to improve either a process or something that happened within the environment. So what we did was instead of doing a yearly or a twice-a-year test, we actually came up with a software called DR Verify. What DR Verify does in our CRVS, our Cloud Recovery Virtual Server um, service, does monthly testing, unattended testing, for your, your virtual environment. Okay? You let us know when you want these tests kicked off. We will automatically kick those off for you and give you a certified test, right, a, a demonstrable test that you actually passed or failed. An example of the report is over here on the right-hand side of the screen, but it's going to be a verified test that you either passed or failed. Now, I talk about, the, I talk about failure a little bit in, in some of my previous uh, comments. If it failed, that's okay, right? Could it be a DLL that got corrupted? Could it be that a, you know, um, heaven forbid, you know, someone got hit by Patch Tuesday, right? Things happen in IT. If it doesn't boot up, right, or a failure, we're automatically going to go ahead and retry that test after remediation. And then we're going to give you that, that the, the report to verify that it actually tested and actually passed. That way you can actually go ahead and, and go to your board or, your, or, or the C-level execs and say, hey, we passed our monthly tests. We feel confident that in the event of a disaster that we will be able to recover. Okay? Again, this is, this is, this is, this is one of the key things with our CRVS offering. Now, we talked about, you know, our, our, our backup powered by Veeam. CRVS solution powered by Zerto. 
Okay, that's all in one service provider. So you don't have to worry about going to multiple service providers or doing your, your VM backups locally, shipping them off the tapes to some other some other some other you know uh, data center or or bunker. You can bring it all to us. Okay, these are fully managed and annually tested services. VMware Zero. Okay, we're not also also we're not just a catcher's mitt for your backups. We can also do recovery for your Veeam backups if you're a Veeam if you're a Veeam customer. If not, if you're not a Veeam customer, if you want to transition to Veeam, we can walk you through that as well. Okay, that's what I mean by flexibility. You can start off with backups, you can start off with Zerto or what have you, and then grow into a cloud recovery solution, a backup solution for your virtual environments and your physical environments with us, and also testing. Okay. Now, I want to bring you through one of the use cases here um, that you know I feel is you know important to to talk about here, given the recent um, you know impacts of ransomware that we've had. So. No names are shared on this report, right? This is, uh, you know, this is all whitewashed. But we actually had a, a customer case study. We had a customer that actually got hit with ransomware. They called us up. They declared. We actually worked with them and a third party through the forensic analysis to find the clean data, and that we actually had copies of clean data so they could actually recover from this ransomware attack. Okay. Now, during, um, you know, because of COVID-19, they couldn't travel to the data center. So we worked with them remotely to get to make sure that they didn't have to pay the ransomware. Okay. So the result, again, they didn't have to pay, they, have to, they didn't have to pay the ransomware. And we actually recovered them within hours rather than days, weeks, um, as, some, as as we've all seen on some of the uh, ransomware attacks that have happened here recently in the news. Okay? That's also part of the services that we can provide when you partner with, with SunGuard. So how we do this, okay, um, you know, with, with, the, with the Zerto technology, right, and even with, even with you know, with Veeam, right, this point in time copies, but I'll key in on some of the Zerto pieces here. Zerto has the uh, ability for a journal, okay? What we offer out of the pot, out, out of the gate is a three day journal, right? In case something happens over the weekend, we can extend that as a service up to 30 days. We also have the ability to do long term retention where we can actually go up to seven years. That seven-year long-term retention policy is actually on a separate array so you're not you know they're on a, on a back-end uh, back data domain storage so in case you get hacked we can actually find where the breach happened and then bring you back home whether that's through the journal or whether we're going to our long-term uh, long-term uh, repository on our back end. Okay. Again, this this is this is kind of one of one of our marquee offerings that we have to actually go ahead and actually help you folks if needed in a cyber recovery event. Now, uh, you know, again, you know, I've, I've taken you through a few slides here um and you know, I, I really appreciate, you know, the time when you think about it, and when you think about what we've discussed here in the past slides, partnering with us, okay, there's realized benefits with that. So again, it's not a DIY, so it's all white glove service, fully managed, right? That gives you these three key points, right? The certainty that the the service that you partnered with us to deliver is 100% configured, installed, 
We do a whole bunch of testing along the way to ensure that when we it goes into steady state that everything is up and running and everything actually works. So that's going to give you the confidence to know that you can actually sleep at night, that the services are, will actually function in case of a disaster, whether it's natural, you know, uh, you know, accidental, you know, deletion of a of a file or or, or a database or what have you, right? Things happen, okay, and you'll be protected. Okay, again, it's the whole you be able to sleep at night and actually be protected, knowing that we have you back. Okay, now with that, you know, I'd like to leave you with a few things. Right, there's a couple links here um, on our services that you know the we have the, the the Gartner guide that I spoke about in some previous slides. Go ahead and you can go ahead and link. It'll bring you to that um, bring you to that page. We also have all our stuff about cloud recovery. Again, we don't just do the virtual. We do all the big iron stuff, right? So we'll have you fully protected, whether it's physical, virtual. You know, old big iron, we have you covered. And then again, just a just a blog about us. Okay. With that, you know, I'd like to you know thank you again for your time. Um, seems that it's been a long day for you folks. I really appreciate you allowing me the time to talk to you. Um, with that, I'll uh, open it up to some Q and A. Absolutely. Yeah. Great presentation, Jeff. We do have some questions for you uh, while we take those questions. I'm just going to bring up a poll for everyone out there in the audience. The question is, what additional information would you like about SunGuard? And we'll leave that up uh, while we take your questions. So uh, let's see. A lot of great questions coming in, Jeff. Um, first one here, uh, Jeffrey actually is asking, uh, can backups be restored to the cloud or where is the data uh, backed up? or sorry, restored with SunGuard? Yeah, great question and thank you for that. So the, the data is actually restored on our end, okay? And then we actually can, we, we will give you VPN access to verify that restoration. And then from that, what we can do is actually hand you, uh, hand you over the VM or bring it back to you as well, okay? Um, so it's actually, it's actually in our data centers, not in AWS or Azure. If that's something you would like us to explore, again, we're open to that. Please feel free to reach out to us and we can help, uh, help you solution that um, if that's one of your needs as well. Got it, excellent. And I think that kind of goes along with Charles's uh, question here who's asking if SunGuard still offers hardware-based DR you know, recovery or is everything going into some sort, of, some sort of cloud? And the answer I think you said there is uh, yes, you still offer hardware-based hardware -based recovery. Yes, yes, absolutely. If that's if that's from you know the big iron mainframes, uh, AIX platforms, or what have you, we have a solution, uh, you know, in our you know in our tool belt as I'll call it, to meet the needs of any hybrid IT customer. Um, again, we've been doing this for for over 40 years. Uh, we're not new to the market. Uh, we've seen things, right and Obviously, you learn from it as you see it, but yes, we have everything covered, um, so please reach out. Nice, very nice. And then let's see, another question here, uh, they're asking, um, how do I know which product or offering from SunGuard to choose? Okay, well, that that's kind of, you know, I take it as a consultative approach, kind of, kind of, you know, kind of partnership, right? Um, the way I look at it is there's multiple things that your business will need. Uh, it's my job as an SE to listen to your requirements, and then offer up a few solutions, right? You know, we talk about some of the RTOs and RPOs. You know, some of our solutions offer different varying levels of that. So it's up to, it's up to us, you know, and my counterparts here to actually listen to that and, and come up with, a, you know, a few solutions that meet your needs. Right, it's not just a one solution fits all. Um, that's why you know, we have varying solutions that we can actually go ahead and mold, if you would, um, to the needs of of your business. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I like that uh, consultative approach there. And then there's someone yes, else absolutely. here who's, yeah, they're asking, you know, why would I do managed DRAS or, or DRAS in general uh, versus just kind of the DYI approach? Like, hey, I've got another data center. I'll send my backups over there. Why, why do you folks choose to go with DRAS and managed DRAS solutions? Well, yeah, and, and, and you know, so a very good question, right? Um, and I get asked this a lot because I've been in this, uh, I've been in this uh, space for a while. But you know, one time um, I went to a customer site where they did a DIY uh, implementation. I was looking for managed. What they did was they bought a solution. I'm not going to say which solution they bought, but they're like, "Yep, yeah, we're all in on this solution." We're going to go ahead and implement it on ourselves by ourselves. What happens when you do that, right? I mean, we're all busy, right? We've all been in IT for a while. You start that project, you get pulled off to another project, and then all of a sudden, things kind of that project that you were supposed to implement kind of not goes by the wayside, but kind of gets kind of pushed down in priority, right? Because priorities change. Come to find out, there was a um, data breach where they had to do a recovery. That server they tried to recover from was not protected from that solution that they bought. So from there, there's data loss because they couldn't recover that server. So with a managed recovery, right, or you know, or managed backup or or DRAS, again you have the confidence of getting the entire lot installed, you know, fully implemented, tested. So now you're fully covered. Absolutely, yeah. That that yeah. confidence and that support, knowing that someone's there to help you. Um, excellent. Let's see. It looks like we're starting to run out of time here in our live Q and A, Jeff. I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, wrap up. But there's a lot more uh, great questions there for you in the queue, the electronic queue. Uh, again, great presentation. Thank you for joining us today on the Thanks. MegaCast. Great. Thank you very much for having me. It was, uh, it was enjoyable. Thank you very much. And for more information on SunGuard availability services, I encourage everyone to check out the handouts tab there, and you'll find a resource uh, entitled Maximum Recovery Confidence with DRAS uh, using SunGuard availability. So I encourage you to check that out and download it, review it after the event. All right, I'll leave the poll question up for everyone to respond to while I announce our next prize winner. We have another Amazon $500 gift card. This one's going to Marlene Stump from Nebraska. Congratulations. And our next grand prize for an Apple M1 laptop, this one going to Lucian Barber from Ohio. Congratulations. Still another grand prize and gift card to give out on the Megacast today. So make sure you stay tuned for that, as well as another awesome presentation. Speaking of which, it's now time to introduce you to our next presenter. I'm excited now to bring on Stephen Lord, Senior Manager for Product Management at Ensono. Stephen, it's great to have you on the Megacast. Thanks, David. Glad to be here. Excellent. Well, take it away. Okay, great. Well, uh, hello everyone. As David mentioned, uh, I'm Steve Lord and I lead our infrastructure product management team here at Insono. Just a little bit about Insono. Insono is a managed services provider where we help our clients achieve their business goals through digital transformation by helping them reduce cost and, and use this money to reinvest in their applications. We have a, a unique portfolio of managed mainframe, IBMI, x86, both physical and virtual, private cloud and public cloud with AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud services. With this approach, uh, we can not only help our clients save money, but really help them optimize and modernize their applications, uh, where it might be private cloud today, but public cloud tomorrow. You know, And I, I want to thank uh, Dell for helping us sponsor this event as well. Okay. Uh, for today's agenda, we live in a hybrid cloud world, so my focus today will be on disaster recovery while working in this type of an environment. Uh, to have a successful DR strategy, it, still, it really does start with a DR plan, uh, but that plan needs verification and with testing, so we'll walk through this. 
And then we'll go through how we do DR uh, when we have a mixed environment with physical and virtual systems, because this is the reality that most, most companies uh, are in today. And with that, we are going to start with our first polling question. So this is going to help me set the stage and learn a little bit about our audience here. Uh, I want to see uh, where everybody is at in their DR strategy and their DR planning. So to me, DR starts uh, with having that plan. So, so let's see where everybody is at uh, with having a plan here. Absolutely. Yeah, we see a lot of responses coming in already. Uh, thank Great. you for those. Let's get a few more, and then I'll share the results here with you, Steve, and you can tell me what you think. So far, it's coming in like I was hoping to see. That's good. Excellent. Well, I'll share the results now. Looks like we've got a, a good number of responses. Thank you, everyone out there. Uh, it looks like... Okay. Uh, Twenty percent, yeah, uh, have a DR plan and uh, have done a successful test uh, two or more times a year. Uh, Thirty percent test once a year. Uh, you know, it was started really well in the beginning, but uh, that bottom area started creeping up. So, um, you know, which is great. So we'll talk about a little bit about that today and how we go through our DR planning and DR testing. So really, obviously, our goal here is we want to help educate people and bring really bring them up from, you know, those those folks that are doing maybe a DR plan but don't do any testing at all uh, to those that, you know, they think they might have a plan. Uh, hopefully they their, their company really does have a plan. They just may not be aware of it. So, okay. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, those folks Great. on the bottom there really could use your help, I think. <laughs> so they could use, yes. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the world is moving towards hybrid cloud. Many companies typically have applications running in uh, legacy systems, uh, such as mainframe, IBM, physical, big database servers, uh, as well as having VMs running in private and public cloud. So there is a mix of solutions that really we need to account for. This uh, 451 research chart on the right really shows us perfectly where over time, companies will have less traditional in the data center and more of a mix with data center systems, private clouds, as well as having public cloud. You know, that result uh, of this is really a much more complicated DR strategy. You need to understand the capabilities of the technology vendor you're using along with the platform you have your applications running on. So when in your data center or, or in a uh, service provider's data center, you do have more control and customization capabilities uh, that may be important to achieve for very low RTO and RPO times and also to meet your SLAs. Uh, you know, and, and if, if having a diverse set of platforms to manage, you know, really wasn't complex enough, you need to account for those regional and, and even global locations. Now, in many cases, you do want to have more than one of these locations because it allows for you to, you know, fail over between sites. Um, but again, if you take that to the nth degree, having multiple sites can really make a much more uh, more complex web uh, for a solution that you're trying to get accomplished. You know, I think most companies realize uh, backups alone are not a DR plan and cannot recover really, in, for the most case, in the RPO and RTO times needed to, to meet your SLAs when you combine this with the new complexities of hybrid IT and traditional data centers failing over using backup restores in a remote data center to recover from will typically fall short of what is needed. Backups are great for corruption and recovering from version control issues, but really not so good with, in my opinion, DR and, and meeting RP and RTO times and, and really what we found and, and really working with a lot of our clients. Now, I will say backup can still play an important role for non-critical systems and access to historical data even while you're in a disaster mode, uh, and should still play a role in a DR plan, but they are, again, just one tool needed for a DR solution. All right, so what is, what is the old adage? Uh, hope is not a plan, and when it comes to actually having a disaster, if you don't have a plan, well, then you have no hope. So, so building out the plan uh, is really the first step in ensuring that you have a successful DR solution put in place. When our BCDR team works with a client to ensure a successful DR solution, 
there are really four key elements that they go through. And so this is where I want to, you know, really talk to everybody about, you know, how we go about uh, doing DR because we do hundreds of DR tests uh, every year. Uh, you know, the first is working with the client to understand uh, their business requirements by application. So not just overall as a company, but really digging down deep and, and going through their application level recovery needs. You know, how much data, how much downtime can the business tolerate? Because knowing this drives not only the DR solution, but could also influence the production platform uh, the applications need to run on to achieve those RPO and RTO times. Assessment uh, is critical, uh, you know, because again, this is where you know for a fact what you thought you knew about your environment and how your applications interact and communicate with each other. Uh, one of my favorite tools we use for assessments is application mapping, because honestly, application mapping helps in so many ways. We use it to help clients see what is communicating for DR planning, but also for security assessments, for migration planning into other data centers, and with moves to public cloud. I really can't stress enough how important knowing information about how your environment communicates not just inventory, but how it communicates is critical for DR planning. You do not want to miss a key virtual machine needed for a failover group. Uh, so now your applications will also change over time, and this means your DR plan will change over time. So periodic or even really continuous assessments are needed to ensure success. Uh, and again, as, as changes are made, let's get that DR plan updated. And there's a lot of tools out there that can help do some of that automated. Um, but when you have such a heterogeneous mix of systems that are legacy and uh, as well as virtual, uh, at times there's going to be some manual updating of that, of that DR plan. The, uh, the 451 chart, research chart that we showed, uh, that we saw showed the complexities of, of that private and public cloud changing over time, um, you know, that, are, that is happening in our current in our industry. And it will be a major update to the DR plan as applications move from on-prem uh, to a private or, or public cloud. So that's also major complexity along with any global locations for those systems. And finally, you know, someone in the company, you know, really needs to be accountable for the creation and continuous updating of what we like to call the technical recovery plan, you know, depending on the size of the company. Preferably, this person's sole purpose in life is that is as that DR coordinator and usually part of a, of a compliance organization. Uh, and I know uh, here at Insoda we have a team of dedicated DR coordinators for our clients, as well as having uh, individuals responsible just really for our own DR planning as a company in case you know Insoda itself uh, has a disaster. So now that you have a DR plan. Uh, you need to test it and ensure that you can do what you say you can do. So, but uh, you can read all the technical uh, recovery plans you want, but without testing, you're not going to gain the necessary experience right. in dealing with a disaster situation, as well as just auditing the plan to ensure it works. Uh, you know, as I walk through this, you will see why having a, a DR coordinator is necessary. Here, I'm showing you the steps again that what we go through with our coordinators when we work uh, with our different clients. Uh, first, uh, scheduling uh, the test. It seems kind of basic, but uh, different times of the year, uh, different clients will have different either end of year, whether it's holidays or, or their business spike. So it's ensuring, you know, where's the, what's a good time of the year to be able to do that DR testing. So, you know, first scheduling a test with a client, uh, their internal teams and Sono internal teams to ensure that you'll get the proper representation from the team uh, that will be involved in those normal recovery efforts. Then as we get uh, to the 90 day test, 90 days from the test, we are trying to lock in that scope uh, and the people that are going to be involved in this test. You know, again, remember plans change throughout the year as the environment changes. So the people involved may change as well, but we want to start locking you know, that, that test, you know, that group that's going to be involved about that 90 day mark. Then uh, at 60 days, we are now meeting with these different individuals within Insono, but also with our client and potential vendor involvement. So in many cases, you might have some third party vendors uh, that are going to play a role in your DR test. We review the technical recovery plan to ensure the roles and responsibilities are instead, understood, uh, but also to make sure that uh, no new changes have come in and, and that we're 
we're getting ready to implement that technical recovery plan, and everybody has a chance now to re-review it uh, and ensure that uh, you know we think it'll be a successful test. You know, then we have the DR test itself. We are executing the plan and documenting uh, what is working, and really, honestly, just as important, what might not have worked according to the plan. Um, but you know, it does not end with the test, right? As I think we could all kind of understand, the process needs to continue with those actor act after action type meetings and reviews on how the test went. You know, what, uh, what worked and what needs to be fixed or improved. This is ultimately why uh, we test typically once or twice a year, because again, as the environment changes, the plan will change, and as the plan changes, it needs to be tested. So I know we had a, a decent number of people that have a plan, but maybe don't test, you know, and then there's some others that, you know, the test is unsuccessful. So, you know, periodic testing and, and having these type of after action meetings is super critical uh, because otherwise you're, you're having a plan is just really checking a box, maybe for some compliance person to say, yep, we, we built a plan, but you really have to have some success in testing that plan to really feel confident that if a disaster really did happen, um, that you're going to be protected because let's face it, a test is kind of in a controlled environment. Uh, a real disaster is a little bit more of an uncontrolled environment. Uh, and so having that test be successful is really critical to helping you understand uh, you know, what might happen if a true disaster were to happen. Okay, I know, um, I want to dig a little deeper into the technical architecture. So still at a high level, uh, but it should help with the intricacies of a hybrid cloud type environment. And for the sake of time today, my focus is going to be with those legacy systems and private clouds, you know, what's going on within the data center. But a lot of this will also apply to um, what might happen with the public cloud as well. So hybrid cloud, uh, why all the talk about it? Well, uh, everyone is, and I mean everyone, is moving to the public cloud in one way or another as the stats show. New application development in particular is trending towards a public cloud first mentality. Uh, every single research, whether you're Gartner, Forrester, 451, they're all showing all new development is making its way out into the uh, public cloud world, a lot of that application development. However, uh, they also show just as strongly, like we saw earlier in that chart, that not all applications will make their way to public cloud and will stay in the data center. So we have now this interesting dynamic in how applications might securely interact across these different environments. So uh, now with hybrid cloud or hybrid IT in general, uh, we need to plan for these complexities when it comes to disaster recovery. Okay, uh, this leads us to our second polling question of the day. Well, what does your hybrid IT estate look like? Uh, sorry, go ahead, David, is that you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great question here on the screen for everyone out there that says, uh, what does your hybrid IT estate look like? And really just, this is kind of like, what, what's your infrastructure look like today? You know, maybe you have a mix of mainframes or power servers, physical servers, VMs, on-prem, and then perhaps some public cloud as well. Uh, maybe you just have uh, a mix of physical servers with VMs on-prem and public cloud, uh, maybe a mix of VMs on-prem and public cloud, or maybe you're all in on public cloud. So let's give everyone a moment to respond to this one, and I'll share the results, and um, we can see what you think about it. Steve? Yep, it's coming in like I think, yeah, like I thought it would. We have a, a decent number of people that are all in on public cloud. But that traditional group, you have people that are the physical PMs and on-prem. That's kind of what I was expecting to see as the highest category. Yeah, so I just shared the results. It uh, looks like 42% said they have a mix of physical servers, VMs on-prem, and public cloud. Uh, what do you think, Steve? Yeah, I mean, any type of uh, long-term company or company that's been around for typically over going to be over 20 years, you're, you're – all of them are going to have a mix of that physical VM and on-prem, and we have a good, we have actually a really good mix of people that have, when you add in the the mainframe and power servers on this in this crowd. So that's really interesting to see as well. You know, we do quite a bit of power 
and mainframe here. So we know, you know, people have been preaching the, the death of the mainframe for 20 years. And I think 20 years from now, they're still going to be preaching the death of the mainframe and it's going to still be kicking. And, you know, because IBM continues to uh, bring out new hardware, new operating system versions, the mainframe and those power systems are very far from dead. Okay, great. Thanks, David. I'll uh, continue on then. Yeah, it was a great, great mix to see. All right, uh, to give you a feel for what you could do yourself. So I'm going to describe about a little bit what we do for DR. So you could take this as some information uh, and to apply it for your own company. You know, our, our Insona Private Cloud uh, platform hosts a lot of our clients' business critical applications. So for us, it was important to have a robust integrated disaster recovery approach that meets the RPO and RTO requirements for our clients. Uh, we need to really not only plan for the production systems, but also enable DR capabilities uh, in our private cloud environment. So super critical. We, we have uh, all kinds of insurance, banking, uh, manufacturing companies, uh, you know, we, you name it, the, the industry, and it's, and it's typically running in one of our data centers. So uh, all those different types of industries also can have some different needs when it comes to uh, RP and RTO. So a lot of flexibility, a lot of flexibility is needed. Um, you know, we use uh, VM storage replication for sub 15 minute RPOs and really scripted network syncs and failover for sub six hour RTO. People get a little bit squirrely when they hear that maybe six hour RTO. We're talking the entire environment in six hours. So uh, all the staging and all the groups and the prioritization groups as they fail over, those again are going to come up, you know, as you declare that disaster, you want to go to the DR site, they'll start coming up immediately. But we're really talking from beginning to that last server coming online uh, for that full RTO. Uh, you know, and what this means is that your applications also in this type of environment are protected uh, really from the moment you deploy them uh, because of automation used to enable us. So I'm focusing a little bit more here on, on the private cloud environment. But I'll talk a little bit more about how we, how we integrate that physical server world as well. Uh, one of the key factors here to, to making our private cloud successful for production in DR really is that secret sauce called software defined networking you see it right there at the top banner this is uh you know we use we use sdn to enable some you know some really smart capabilities that you just can't do with with many other solutions that that don't offer it uh you know virtual machines that work together to support an application can be grouped uh providing the ability to spin up individual applications on the dr side uh, for a test without needing to coordinate with or even impact other application teams. So now, you know, we really have options for mini uh, testing before you deploy a new application. You can also test and make sure it works at the DR site. Uh, that software-defined networking separates production, completely separates production from DR. So you have the ability to run a DR test, a full DR test, and bring up your applications in the DR site while continuing to run uh, production without any inter interruption. You know, we create what we call a network isolation bubble uh, to make this testing possible. Uh, there is no need to make any changes to your application when flipping to the DR data center. Uh, no IP address changes, no reconfiguration. It just works in DR as it did in production because in essence, it is in production that just now happens to be running at the DR site. In the event of a disaster, we fail over the entire virtual data center and its networks. Uh, the virtual machines and applications have an identical network configuration at the DR site. This brings the environment up very quickly uh, and reduces downtime in the event of a, a failure reverse scenario. Now, again, as a service provider, we have invested in the skills to enable um, this type of work and be able to pull it off. Uh, but I guess the big question is, can, can, do you have the skills needed to be able to pull something like this off? You know, cloud skills in particular are tight. So if you're doing a private cloud on your own, you really need to start and keep investing in your team's cloud skills with self-service portals uh, and, and SDN, software-defined networking, is a critical piece of this to make it uh, really happen. Well, like I mentioned, uh, VMs are great, but some of our most critical applications tend to run on physical hardware, such as mainframe and big Oracle or SAP appliances and power. You know, we had quite a few people that were running a mix of, uh, of that uh, type of technology. Well, guess what? 
Uh, you know, just because they are physical does not mean they cannot benefit from being in a software-defined network. If there is one thing for me that, that beats that application mapping that I was talking about, uh, it's software-defined networking as a tool because it is really just such a great enabler. Uh, you know, everything that can be done programmatically instead of having to plug and, and play different uh, pieces of equipment together. You know, and again, yes, these physical servers and appliances are connected to physical switches, but it's really that software-defined networking network overlay that really controls the network and how virtual and physical servers communicate and are allowed to communicate for security and, or for network isolation, um, you know, again, especially when we're doing a DR test. You couple this with automation of virtual infrastructure and application builds, and now what you really turned uh, this into is a software-defined data center with a mix of virtual and physical systems. And honestly, again, SDN is the key ingredient to making a software-defined network data center uh, a reality. All right, so just as I mentioned, uh, you know, we recognize that most clients uh, are going to have a hybrid estate, and not all workloads will run as virtual machines in the private cloud. So holistically, these environments need to be able to communicate with each other. Uh, our private cloud is easily connected to leading public clouds via our, our uh, Cloud Connect service. Cloud Connect is our high-performance connectivity offering built on Megaport today that delivers on-demand connectivity to the major public clouds, including VMware Cloud and AWS, Azure VMware Solution, uh, as well as a native public cloud with AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. You know, an edge pod is, you know, that seamlessly integrates that physical systems that I was just talking about in the previous slide into in Sonos uh, private cloud software defined networking environment, really for that consistency of security policy and high performance. So when you bring this all together, you have one management plane for centralized control of the entire environment. And we have our Insono Envision portal to give clients visibility to their data and data analytics across, really across all of these different platforms. Okay, uh, next steps. When this call is over, hopefully I've made you think about how your current production and DR environments are set up, as well as the planning. Think about how you answer that first question. And if you have a plan in place, test it as well as uh, maintain and improve it over time. So everybody has some homework to do. And if you don't have a plan, well, then you need to build it now. Uh, assess what your IT environment looks like today and how it's going to change over time and incorporate this into your planning. And finally, you know, be honest with yourself. Do you have the expertise to really pull this off? Or do you need training or outside help? And Sona manages IT systems. Uh, you know, for allowing uh, clients to be great at what they do and with your business and your applications. So we are also here to help with that. Okay, and David, I think I'm ready for some questions. Excellent, yeah, great presentation. We do have some questions for you. While we do that, I'm just going to bring up a poll for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about the Insono solution? And we appreciate your feedback on that, of course. So uh, let's see, a lot of good questions here for you, Steve. Uh, first one, um, any advice on reconciling different RPOs and RTO requirements from different lines of business? Okay, so you're all, you know, I touched back onto the plan. That plan when you're doing an assessment of the environment you are definitely going to have different RTO and RPOs uh, requirements. And, you know, again, it's going to require different technology needs. Certainly if you have anything that's like I touched on the 15 minute RPO, six uh, hour RTO, what we're doing there is, you know, that storage replication, right? So it's, it's understanding your technology set uh, from a VMware or a virtual machine based environment. Uh, storage replication for us is the key. Get that data over to the other site as quickly as possible. Uh, and then we use that scripting to bring up that remote site at the other side. So again, using different tools uh, for us, you know, we are using vCloud Director Availability to uh, make a lot of that happen within our private cloud environments. Uh, we also have clients that have 
some you know dedicated VMware environments where we might use Zerto and other tools to to bring those systems up as well as Site Recovery Manager from VMware to bring those systems up quickly. Um, if you have those critical systems that, uh, or I should say some non-critical systems, uh, then what you could do is start using you know you know backups again. They're they're great for version control like I mentioned before, uh, but those backups can also play a really nice role uh, in all those uh, maybe non-critical systems. Maybe you still want to bring up your dev test environment at the other site eventually so that your developers and others can do some testing, especially if you think you're going to be in a disaster mode for a long period of time. Uh, then having those backups to bring up those types of environments eventually um, you know, is also plays an important role. So they don't want to discount backups. It's really important for a DR solution should always be a part of it, uh, but it's not necessarily going to get you those RPO and RTO times that you're looking for to really bring up uh, production as quickly as possible. Got it. I, I like that flexibility, that kind of customized approach for different applications and needs, and you've got different tools to, to meet those needs. Uh, so that's smart. It's not just a one-size-fits-all kind of approach. No, because, it, yeah, to add to that, it's expense too, right? So let's let's face it, a lot of this is going to come down to money. And uh, disaster recovery isn't necessarily the most inexpensive item. It's an insurance policy and one that you hope you never have to use, but it's an important insurance policy for the business. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, let's see, here's a question from Carrie who asks, uh, does Insono provide uh, complete DR plans for your customers and are they updated after DR exercises? Uh, yes, hey Carrie. So yes, we work with clients. Uh, so many of our clients uh, might already have a DR plan. So we'll review that with them uh, as well as make uh, amendments to it with them. So we'll follow through using our best practices and how a successful DR can go uh, with all the ex different ex amounts of experience and years of experience that we've had. So it'll be tailored to the different uh, technology platforms. Mainframe might be a little different, obviously, than a private cloud VMware-based environment. Um, but we do work with the clients to uh, review those technical recovery plans. And like I mentioned in a previous slide, you know, that last step of understanding your overall plan, it's, it starts with building a plan, reviewing the plan, testing the plan, and then those after action meetings to see how did the test go. If the test didn't go well, well, what updates need to be done to make a, a successful test? You know, and then sometimes we can fast track that second test and go, if something really did fail, um, well, we want to try to test uh, the updates to it as quickly as we can, not just wait for next year to happen for the next test to, to occur. Um, as well as, again, review changes to those plans throughout the year because you know, everybody's environment is always going to change. So we wanted to continuously update the plan, and then it's really important to test it to make sure we thought what was going to happen does actually happen, and, and we're successful with it. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, there's another question here. Have you seen DR from on-prem to public cloud? What have you seen going on in that area? Okay, well, that's a that's a great question, and honestly, that's that's a difficult one. Uh, typically, very different technologies are in play. Uh, where you can get some uh, success uh, with low RPO and RTO times uh, is a VMware, but you know, let's just say a, an, as an example, clients are using a VMware solution. Most most clients, uh, if they still have on-prem, uh, have VMware running around in their environment. So uh, a VMware on-prem or even on like a private cloud like we have to a, a VMware cloud on AWS solution. So using... Um, uh, third-party replication tools or VMware Site Recovery Manager or uh, VCDR now from VMware that's a little bit newer, you know, running uh, to get this data moved over to that public cloud environment is critical. Uh, you know, this method keeps – what I like about this method when you talk about from a VMware-based solution, it keeps it all within still running in a VMware environment. So what, what that means is that – Though you can leverage the cloud to maybe be that secondary data center for you so instead of having another one, or you want to, you know, you could pick a different Amazon region where you want to have that DR located. 
uh, it's still a VMware environment. So your applications that run in VMware in your data center, you know that the reliability, you can have that confidence that that virtual machine is going to run at that DR site. Now, if you can stand a little bit longer RPO and RTO, uh, this is where, again, the backup software options, uh, where you can back up a VMware VM and restore to VMware Cloud and AWS. Or honestly, you can even restore, in many cases, directly to native AWS and Azure type services. In this case, you're replicating the backups to the public cloud provider, to backup servers you have in the public cloud, and they're using, you know, typically we would replicate to Amazon S3. So we, this is what we do when we're working with clients, or to you know Azure Blob Storage to hold the data. All the big data, uh, I'm sorry, all the big uh, backup software vendors support this type of a backup and restore type of to a cloud solution. Uh, again, however, there's that price to be paid in, in a longer, typically a longer RPO and RTO time. So hopefully that answered Carrie's question. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, it looks like we're starting to run out of time here in our live Q&A session. But um, there's a lot more really excellent questions in the electronic queue for you, Steve. Uh, we'll get those okay, over great. to you. And, of course, I'm sure they appreciate your feedback on those. But really great presentation. Thank you so much for being on the Megacast today, Steve. I Thank you, David. I appreciate your time. And everybody else is, too. Absolutely. And thank you, too, and Sono for supporting the event and joining us on the event today. Uh, make sure that you check out the handout there in your audience console on how to test your company's disaster preparedness. It's got some great stats on it. Uh, go ahead and download that resource as well as all the other resources that are available there in the handouts tab before you go. Uh, thank you to everyone who responded to the poll. I'll leave that up while I announce our final prize winners. We have another Amazon $500 gift card, this one going to Eileen Collins from California. And our final grand prize, uh, this is for another Apple M1 MacBook. This is going to Ian Zakork from Illinois. Congratulations, Ian Zakork from Illinois. I will post all the prize winners' names in the questions pane. There we go. Those are posted now. And before you go, I want to remind you to – don't forget to uh, subscribe to the 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes store. You'll also find the Gorilla Guide podcast there as well. Uh, visit gorilla.guide for more information and download those free Gorilla Guides out there for additional information, many of them on uh, disaster recovery and data protection as well. If you are a potential sponsor of an upcoming Megacast or Ecocast event, uh, reach out to us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. We would love to chat with you about prepare, or sponsoring or uh, presenting on an upcoming Megacast or Ecocast. And I hope to see you next week on another really cool topic here, building a robust security awareness program for your company. It's going to be a cool event with Kemp, Duo, Rubric, and Rapid7. Hope to see you on that event next Wednesday, September 29th. After the event ends here, you'll be automatically redirected to our Refer a Friend page. Uh, if you refer your IT friends and coworkers there, you can also be entered to win uh, an Amazon $300 gift card drawing uh, each month, uh, both for you as well as your IT friend. So, you know, spread the good news about what we're doing here with the Megacast and Ecocast event series with your friends and coworkers in the IT industry. Thank you to everyone who joined us on today's Data Protection, DRAS, and Disaster Recovery Megacast event. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.